that the May? Yeah, it was the May 7th. I have to look. Well, it was uh, your son's graduation. Oh, that's right. 22nd. 22nd. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> okay, and the one before that was April. Uh, okay. You got it? but I will call you tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's a busy day. I was in L.A. And Good evening. I'd like to call the June 26th uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees to order. Welcome, everyone. I, uh, we have a report from a uh, closed session um, after we do our Pledge of Allegiance and roll call. Trustee Bastrick, can you please lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance? My pleasure. Stand if you are able and put your hand over your heart. Ready, begin. Thank you, Trustee Baxter. Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Virginia Baxter. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Doug Otto. Here. Uruak Joe Intuck. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. We will now move on to item 2.4, report on closed session items. The Board of Trustees convened in closed session <coughs> pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.8 and discussed with its real property negotiators, price in terms of a payment associated with the proposed sale of the district's Los Coyotes diagonal site. The Board of Trustees voted unanimously to approve the Olson Urban Housing LLC's request to amend the purchase and sale agreement to extend the due diligence period until July 25th, 2019 for the purchase of the Long Beach Community College District's Los Coyotes diagonal site. All right, we will now move on to item 2.5, um, public uh, comments on agenda items. The public is allowed to address the board before or during the consideration of any item on the agenda, a total of three minutes, will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. Um, the first speaker that we'll hear from uh, will be on item uh, 7.1, layoffs. Uh, Hilda Yerksitis, and forgive me if I'm um, mispronouncing your name. Is Hilda here? Come on up, Hilda. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for My name is Hilda, you excited? Thank you. I started working here at Long Beach City College in 1995 as an LTE. I am one of the two assessment coordinators that are being laid off. I have seniority over the other coordinator. The reason given to us is the mandate AB705 and lack of work. 
there is still assessment taking place, and it is, it is not, and it will not stop until January 2020. We also handle all the matriculation-related duties, along with processing multiple measures, among with other things, among other things. Why are we being laid off now? Uh, based on the contract, if we are being laid off due to lack of work for the two coordinators, the one with less seniority should be the one to be laid off or reassigned. There is plenty of duties to be taken care of by just one coordinator. However, the contract protocol is not being followed. I have seniority and I am being laid off as well. Uh, could you please take some time to review all the facts and pertaining information before a decision is made? Your course consideration is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you. I do have copies of the seniority fact sheet if, uh, if sure. I could distribute it. Our board secretary will distribute it to us. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ron Miller on agenda 4.1. Mr. Miller. Good evening, board president, trustees. I'm Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building Trades. I'm here on behalf of 140,000 hardworking uh, men and women of the building trades in LA and Orange County. Some of them here tonight, would you guys like to stand up? So these are the true partners of Long Beach City College, these guys here. Their apprenticeship programs and their local unions, they're the ones that are bringing the skilled trained workforce and the opportunity for apprenticeship to your, to your community here locally. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. We're, we're proud of the partnership here. Th this partnership is a glowing example of what we can do when people work together. And, and together with the carpenters and the building trades, you have the finest skilled and trade, trained labor here on your campus and the projects are showing that, and the cost effectiveness is showing that. So this, uh, this uh, amendment that we're doing to the agreement, uh, we talked about this early on after we first got the agreement in place uh, to cover the new bond work that you got, and negotiating with your staff wasn't easy. I don't think either side got exactly what they wanted, but we, did have a, we do have a deal, uh, a tentative agreement based on your vote tonight. We do think we captured a good bit of work to where we can continue this partnership and grow it. It's very important to have pathways to good middle-class jobs uh, available to the constituents in your community, and this amendment does that for the next 10 years. It brings good middle-class jobs, good projects on your campus, and it opens up other agreements that we have in the LA Basin to your constituents also, which is uh, a very good thing. Not only Long Beach, but uh, uh, in, the, in the Southland here. So if the men and women that we're bringing into the trades, if they can work in LA County for 30 years in their career, they're very lucky. And the stuff that we're doing together is gonna make that happen. So I'll be here for any questions, but thank you and I uh, urge you to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Next, we have Mr. John Hanna on item 4.1. Okay. Uh, welcome, Mr. Hanna. Welcome to, uh, to you and for all the carpenters who are here and our fellow building trades people, uh, uh, board members, uh, Madam President, uh, and uh, staff and faculty members. Uh, John Hanna with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. 
I'm here to kind of be the amen course for what Ron Miller just said. Um, you passed a uh, community and student workforce agreement. Uh, it's worked well here. Uh, it works well on uh, my campuses, because uh, I'm also a trustee at Arancho Santiago Community College District. I can't vote on it now, uh, but I see what's happening to it. And I see the ability, the student part is critical for you, your educators. And what this does is it takes workforce training and it gets these people the best opportunity for the highest income possible for their skill sets. You're training people for the middle class. You're not training them for people who are going to get picked up in front of Home Depot. And that's the extent of their training. Because that's what you get when you don't have this kind of workforce agreement. You have the security that there won't be a work stoppage. You have the security that your students, and that's who they are, the, your pre-apprentice and your students, your, your apprentices, that those people will articulate to come out with about 30 units of academic credit and then it's your job and our job to try and get them to go on because in addition to training the skilled workers, we're having an aging workforce and an aging contractor base. So we always need to uh, give people that opportunity to grab that golden ring. That's what's so great about higher education. And that's what you're doing here. Now there's some naysayers who say, oh, don't do this, there's cost overruns. Nonsense. Community after community now are turning towards these form of agreements because you get a, a committed, a regular, and a local labor supply that's often in shortage. These are not people who are not well-trained, but just show up with a labor broker. You'll be confident that all laws will be uh, complied with, that you'll have a drug-free workforce, and that you'll have students who will be successful. And that's what it's all about. So I urge you to adopt this um, and adopt this tonight. No agreement's perfect. As Ron said, he couldn't get anything, everything he wants. There's a couple of things in there about uh, a curriculum that I'm not real excited about. But on balance, this is a good agreement for Long Beach City College, most of all for its students and for the community. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Mr. Marco uh, Torun, uh, forgive me, Toruno, uh, if you are here. And I just noticed, Madam Secretary, um, I think... Uh, I apologize, I should have asked for the time. Um, not that you guys need to be timed, but just uh, so that we're sticking to our three minutes. Yes, go ahead. Hello, Marco, welcome. Oh, good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Marco Taruno. I'm a resident here in uh, Long Beach. I'm here to speak about the MC3 uh, pre-apprenticeship program that uh, the school um, offers. Um, a few years back, I was looking uh, for a career change, um, need a little more, more security for my family. And uh, without a college degree, it was uh, pretty challenging. Uh, I heard about this MC3 uh, program that uh, Army City College was uh, offering, so I looked into it. And then I uh, applied and was accepted into the program. Um, through this program, I was able to learn about different trades, uh, different unions, and uh, upon completion of the, of the uh, program, I was able to apply and get accepted to the uh, Plumbers Union, Local 78, uh, service that we service Long Beach and uh, Los Angeles. Um, I'll be entering my fourth year into uh, the apprenticeship program, and uh, Getting into the, the program was one of the best decisions I was uh, able to make and I was able to, to get into a career in, in, with, with a trade uh, that has been very uh, rewarding and, and secure. I um, was able to purchase a home and provide a little more security uh, for, for my family. So uh, this program uh, was, was a, a good decision that, that I made to get into. So. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity for letting me speak. I just want to let you know that that program, the MC3 program, was, was a good program to have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Omar uh, Gaindo. Welcome, Omar. Uh, 
And just my apologies, a writ large, uh, for <laughs> mispronouncing okay. anyone's name. No problem. Uh, my name is Omar Galindo. I'm with Plumber Local 78. Uh, like Margaret just said, uh, we represent uh, 2,200 members that are from Long Beach and Alley County. Uh, this kind of program is what allows people like Marco and people like myself to get a good, honest, hardworking job that uh, allows us to provide for our families. You know, I myself was raised by a single mother. I'm a veteran. I went to the Marine Corps after I graduated in 2000, did four years, got out, tried a couple of different jobs, and I got into the plumber's union. It was the best decision I ever made for, my, for myself and for my family. So this kind of program is what allows people like myself to have that opportunity to excel and be able to provide for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Hugo um, Gordillo. Gordillo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Hugo J. Gordillo, I'm from Local 562. I'm a special representative with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I myself am a product of Long Beach. I, uh, I too attended here, Long Beach uh, City College, completed uh, quite a bit of units. Uh, pretty proud of that. Currently, I work out of uh, beautiful Bixby Knowles. Um, this agreement would provide uh, our local hires uh, a, livable, a livable wage for our carpenters. And uh, this agreement uh, also would, uh, the apprenticeship, uh, it's a full potential for our youth. And uh, I support uh, the workforce agreement. And uh, thank you for your time. And go Vikings. Well, you sure know the way to our hearts. Uh, Mr. Ted Jimenez. Welcome, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you. Ted Jimenez with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, good evening, President and board members. Um, you know what? I'm going to come in a little bit different direction because I don't want to be redundant. I'm a representative, and I work here in the Southwest. And, you know, I want to I want to give a commitment. The commitment of uh, representatives who are going to help guide these pre-apprentices and who become apprentices in, the, in a career that's going to give them an opportunity for a middle life, for middle class life uh, living standards. And my commitment to you is that I will continue to work hard like we've done in the past, like we're doing today, to get these apprentices guided and maintained in a career that is going to give them uh, this lifestyle and would be able to retire with dignity. Uh, you know, our objective, if everyone here who is here tonight, it's all about one thing, right? It's about success. It's about not only uh, the apprentices coming through being successful from, the, from the, your side, but making sure that we follow through as well and that they uh, have a good, long, good, long career. So thank you for your time, and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Francisco Guerrero. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Francisco Guerrero. I've also lived here all my life. I attended school here as well. Uh, I just want to come up here and thank you guys for uh, this great opportunity helping us put our local pre-apprentices to work and to guide them on an awarding career. So I just came up here to thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, Mr. Francisco Mayorga. Is Mr. Mayorga here? Francisco Mayorga. And it's, I, I, I can't keep getting this one wrong. Um, all right, Mr. Joseph uh, Goldblatt. Hi, Mr. Goldblatt. Thank you. Come on up. Good evening. My name is Joseph Goldblatt. And um, I live here in Long Beach, and I support the extension and the expansion of the project labor agreement. The labor agreement will help support local hiring, which supports our community. I believe in education. This agreement also supports our apprenticeship program. Thank you. Mr. Jordan Bradfield. Hello, my name is Jordan Bradfield and I am a, a union pile driver from local 562 uh, Carpenters here in Long Beach. Uh, my wife is a teacher for Long Beach Unified. My children attend uh, Long Beach Unified School as well. And um, I am asking you to uh, 
have the project labor agreement um, extended. So that it does help families like myself where we are, our roots are set here in Long Beach and having opportunities to work in Long Beach, um, be close to family is a benefit for not just um, my family, but the city as well, because we do take pride in helping to build the city of Long Beach. And that's what we do as carpenters, pile drivers, scaffold from all sorts of uh, areas, but we take pride in building Long Beach. A um, couple things that um, I wanted to mention was um, my uh, son has a special connection with the Vikings football program here with Coach Peabody. Uh, my son was diagnosed with cancer in 2015 and through um, a charity organization called Team Impact, he is partnered with the Vikings football team and he gets to practice with them. He gets to go to football games and be on the sidelines. Um, so I know personally having the option to help with construction of any type of facility here, I would take great pride in that because of the, the help that they have given to my son, getting him back on the road of feeling um, like he can do stuff again. That, that's really what has been big benefit from that uh, uh, team impact partnership with the uh, Vikings football team. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, please vote or the extension on the agreement. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Fave, Tommy Fave. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Tommy Favai. I represent IBEW Local 11. Um, and I'm here, uh, and also with our IBW members that are here uh, as well. But um, I'm here to uh, commit IBW to commit to a pipeline to accept uh, the young men and women to come into the trade. Um, we have close to 1,000 of our members that currently live in Long Beach, uh, and we want that number to grow, uh, especially here at the community college uh, with the current existing uh, community workforce agreement that's in place. Uh, we, we do not want to see a delay in this. We'd like to see an amendment uh, added to the CWA uh, so we can move forward. Thank you. Mr. Matt Matthew Coates. Good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Matt and I'm here on behalf of IBEW Local 11. We are the electricians union here in LA and I'm a longtime Long Beach resident as well as former LBCC student. Um, I walked into, well, <coughs> excuse me, I walked into workforce development expecting to get a new pair of boots and I walked out, I walked into an apprenticeship program. I didn't know what I was walking into but I walked out of it with a career with the electricians union after, you know, successfully completing my MCP program and beginning my apprenticeship. Um, yeah, since then my life's changed and today I walk with a lot of pride as well as my friends and family that support me and I walk here with pride as I work with my brothers and sisters out here in the field. Uh, lastly, I urge that you do not delay this amendment because our community, community needs these agreements and funding. Thank you. Thank you. Roberto Ruiz. Hello, my name is Roberto Ruiz. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to let me speak. I'm from uh, Southwest Carpenters Local 562, and I'm actually a Long Beach resident. I was born and raised here. I came to LBCC. I went through the apprenticeship program, and honestly, this, this program would actually help a student, my family, community, and anybody around us here that are, that are local residents give, have the opportunity for a, a better wages. Um, excuse my public speaking. I actually learned it here, but I'm, I'm so nervous. <laughs> but um, besides that, um, no, I, I, really this, this program and this apprenticeship will really help a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people would, would benefit from that, so I support the labor agreement on the PLA, so thank you. You did just fine. Mr. Zambrano, Frank Zambrano. Good 
board, trustees, chairman. Hey, uh, you know, my name is Frank Zambrano, and uh, um, I represent the Southwest Regional Council. As you can see, there is many tradesmen and women in this, in, in, in this room right here. And you know what? I, this, this agreement right here is about family. It's about family just by listening to, to Brother Jordan and, and a few of the other speakers. With every tradesman that comes in, regardless of trade, hey, it's really easy to be able to get sent out to Santa Monica, be able to get that sent out to Santa Clarita, get sent out to the IE. But with this type of agreement, what it, what it helps is our family. Instead of having to go else, out, you know, whatever part of the, uh, the city that we, we are sent out to go to work, if we have an opportunity to work right here, it's going to give us time to be able to spend, you know, coaching Little League, spending time at, at, at music lessons, ballet, whatever it is that we have our, our, our families involved in, it will give us the opportunity to actually take part in it. Instead of having to uh, uh, pay some child care, you know, in today's world, it takes more than one parent to be able to make a living. And with these union jobs, with these good, fair, paying jobs give us this ability to, to, to create a, not only a success in our career, but to create a great life for our family. So I support this agreement. No further delay, let's pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sergio Sanchez. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sergio Sanchez. Um, I graduated from Jordan High School 2015, and while I was in high school, um, I was lost. I didn't know what I was going to do after high school, and um, until I came across this program called the STAR program. And, um, you know, right after that, I got attached and got, like, you know, more experience with tools and, you know, getting hands-on with, uh, you know, construction. And um, right after I got out of high school, I got this job offer. Uh, thank you to the SART program and uh, the Labor's Union, 1309. And I worked for the city of Long Beach uh, gas department, changing uh, gas meters. And with that, that expanded my uh, knowledge and my resume. And now I'm, at a, I'm a water meter technician for the city of Long Beach. And um, thank you. Thank you. Teresa Hernandez. Welcome, Ms. Hernandez. Good evening. My name is Teresa Hernandez. Um, I joined the same program as him in high school, and I, I really enjoyed it. It taught me a lot of life-changing experiences. I learned a lot of tools and it helped me develop a lot of different mindsets for being a woman and I totally support this agreement. Thank you. Juan Alcaraz. Hello, my name is Juan Alcaraz. I went to David. I went to David Star Jordan here in Long Beach. I participated in the Star program as well, and um, I think without that program, I would have been lost. I was thinking about going to college, but at the same time, I don't know what I wanted to pursue in college. And getting the hands-on from the program, I think it just really guided me to somewhere something I like. And I went. I got into the union and everything, and got done with the the apprenticeship program. And I really strongly approve this agreement. Yeah. Sally Serrano. Hi, my name is Sally Serrano. Um, I'm with the STAR program. Um, I'm here with the laborers of 1309, and um, I've been with the union for a little over three years, um, and I fully support this program. Chelsea Rodriguez. 
Chucky Lopez. How you doing? Good afternoon. My name is Chucky Lopez. I'm part of the Labor's Local 1309, and I graduated from Jordan High School 2015, and I also went through the STAR program on volunteer time during during my senior year of high school, and throughout that time, they, they liked the way how I proved myself, how I volunteered my own time to them, and originally, I was supposed to become a carpenter, and then one of the business agents got worried that I was trying to work already, trying to kick, kick ass and work and, you know, make money throughout in a legitimate way. And after that, he told me that there was a boot camp and I took that offer on that boot camp to join the labor union. And here I am now, I graduated the, the apprenticeship before the age of 21. I'm 22 now. And, you know, it's, the union is a pretty good thing to join too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Andrew Mayorga. Welcome, Mr. Mayorga. Hello, my name is Andrew Mayorga. I'm a business agent with Laguna Local 1309. Uh, those young individuals you guys just uh, heard uh, came from our STAR program, which is our Long Beach Unified Pre-Apprenticeship Program. It stands for Successful Training Apprenticeship Recruitment. And we thought it was very important for you individuals to real, not, you guys don't realize the impacts you guys make on young individuals' lives. These kids, we get them when they're 18, we're at multiple schools in Long Beach Unified. The day after they graduate, the very next week, they're in boot camp and they're starting their careers at 18. That's why we're in support of this. Sorry, thank you so much. Mr. Chris Hannon. I saw him walk out, oh, there we go. Good evening, honorable uh, uh, board president, uh, trustees, staff, president. Uh, my name is Chris Hannon. I'm a representative for the Los Angeles, Orange Counties Building and Construction Trades Council. I work together with uh, Long Beach City College in setting up a pre-apprenticeship program at the Pacific Coast Campus. Uh, by adding this amendment to the existing uh, agreement and spelling out uh, students of the college, and not just of the pre-apprenticeship, but uh, graduates of your associates uh, programs as well. Uh, it's gonna give a more direct link into careers for uh, all of your students. For your pre-apprenticeship students, they're gonna be prepared to go into that trade that, uh, that they have their eye on. And so far, we've gotten over 67 individuals into the trades. Uh, we have a partnering uh, pre-apprenticeship program for women uh, in the area, another 17 uh, Long Beach residents. So out of those 84, uh, 84 placements into union construction careers, they're working over the same period of time compared to the City of uh, Long Beach Project Labor Agreement, which is a great agreement. They're working over twice as many hours as the total City of Long Beach Project Labor Agreement. So by giving more opportunities and more projects to have opportunities on campus here, it's just gonna reinforce the support for those students, uh, get them jump-started to their career, and uh, for the additional years in the future, to give them confidence that the community believes in them, we believe in them, and it's been a fantastic program and it's only gonna get better. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hannon. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Tunua, Ms. Uh, Tunua Thrash Intuk. Welcome, Ms. Mrs. Intuk. Uh, good evening, members of the board and to our chairwoman. My name is Tunua Thrash Intuk, and I'm here to speak in favor of Matter 4.1, the expansion of the Community and Student Workforce Project Agreement. I'm the executive director of LISC. We are a national but local economic development firm that finances commercial development, affordable housing, 
small businesses and drive policy that really creates sustainability for our local families. While studying with my master's degree at MIT, I learned how important it was to ensure that publicly funded projects can have an impact, a triple bottom line impact on our neighborhoods, creating good local paying jobs, quality projects, and community benefits. This agreement can, make, can go a long way in ensuring a positive impact in our community. It'll create good union paying jobs and include health care and retirement. They hire local veterans and local youth, as, you, as you've heard here. And it, it, it ensures that our local economy will be strong. This isn't just good policy. I know personally from the folks who are in my family who work in the trades. I have a member in my family who's a sheet metal worker from Local 105 and another member who is with IBEW Local 569. It has allowed them to provide for their families, to become homeowners, to become productive members of our community, all of which you've heard here today. And all of that is possible because of world-class training and the experiences that they will be able to get here and beyond. And I, I giggle with almost a limited amount of student loan debt because I carry so much myself. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to hear me out on this matter and urge the board to move forward with this economic development policy. I am Tanua Thrash Intuk. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Intuk. Um, we don't have any other speaker cards um, unless anyone has submitted one. We will now move on to item 2.6, approval of the minutes of May 22nd, 2019, regular Board of Trustees meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the board meeting a minute? So move. Second. Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We will now move on to item 2.7, reordering of the agenda. Um, I have not received any requests to reorder the agenda. Um, moving on to item 2.8, Superintendent President uh, Dr. Romali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Long Beach City College. It's so good to have you here in the audience. Um, I hope you do pick up one of our community newsletters and learn more about the college. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity. We have some great news to share with you tonight. Uh, last year, we set a record and increased our graduation by 27%. Well, we weren't gonna, we, we needed to outdo ourselves this year, so we came in over 30% this year, the largest graduating class in the college's history. So, yes, yeah. That's right. Um, you know, we heard the ladies and gentlemen speak about family. Um, when you speak about family, there's no better way to help a family than with a couple of extra dollars. And that piece of paper that we hand folks on graduation day is worth close to a half a million dollars more across their lifetime. So these young men and, and women and older men and women that crossed our stage in June are gonna get great jobs in Long Beach, perhaps with your labor union, perhaps other jobs in Long Beach. So we are building a prosperous Long Beach and we are so proud of that. Increased graduation means increased prosperity for our families. So we're so excited to share that good news with you. Um, secondly, our state of the college for our external community will be held on July 18th. Um, we will also, for our internal community, our employees, will be having a state of the college welcome home Long Beach, which will be held sometime around homecoming. So we'll have a really fun homecoming event. Um, you're going to see uh, up on the screen now, we have some wonderful uh, poll banners. I wanna thank Joshua Castellanos and the marketing team. Um, they, we have wonderful poll banners that advertise our programs around campus. So uh, check those out and please feel free to ask us questions about our exciting programs here. I want to acknowledge that the faculty and staff and administrators and board of trustees of this college love this college. They worked tirelessly this year to get those students across the stage. Uh, there were bur lights burning late at night. There were lights burning on the weekend. I just told my trustees about 15 minutes ago, I have never in my entire career seen a more dedicated board of trustees. They come to every event 
we students are here to support you. We love you, we care about you, and we respect you. And what we do every day is for you. So your success really thrills us. I'd like to share some um, uh, that we went to the, to the Classified Leadership Institute this year, and I was tremendously honored to have been honored by the state Classified Senate in recognition, uh, a recognition award of excellence and service leadership. And I'm so grateful to your leader, Annie Engel, who has done a tremendous job with her team bringing the Classified Senate um, to prosperity and the dais at Long Beach City College. I want to acknowledge two fabulous people. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. She's amazing. There was a recent story in the Signal Hill Tribune that highlighted two of our recent LBCC graduates, Jasmine Slater and Keezen Slater, who are a married couple in their mid-20s who passed their classes while working and raising two little girls. So the couple managed to complete their coursework within three years of enrolling, and it acknowledged LBCC faculty members, professors Priscilla Bravo Arias and Fred Beebe. So I want to thank you so much. Professor Beebe has been here since 1989. And Professor Bravo Arias just joined us. So a little bit of the veteran and a little bit of new. Um, they, our faculty never get tired of helping students. So we have the best faculty out there. Now, uh, unfortunately, I share some sad news that um, Board President Zia, I would request, uh, I would make a suggestion that we uh, retire tonight in memorial of Joan Zuckerman, Professor Joan Zuck Zuckerman, who has passed. She is an active professor in our life science department. And uh, we have our life sciences faculty here today. She grew up in Daly City. She served here since 1996, was department from 2006, department head from 2006 to 2014. She grew up in Daly City, attended community college herself at Skyline, transferred to UC Davis where she got her bachelor's in biochemistry and her PhD in pharmacology and toxicology. And a scholarship has been established in her honor. Thank you to those generous folks who did that. You may send donations if you wish to the foundation through mail code B12. Now, we have some very special acknowledgments, some folks that we would like to acknowledge this evening. And our first acknowledgment will start, uh, Board President Sunny Zia would like to recognize the Port of Long Beach Communications team. Yes. Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Ramali. We wanted to take the time tonight to recognize our first industry partners who have been our uh, staunch, champions and really pioneered the getting industry on board. We have some celebrities here tonight, the board president, board of harbor commissioners, Madam President Tracy Goscu. Uh, we also have our chief of staff to the board of harbor commissioners, um, Richard Jordan. We have deputy executive director Rick Cameron here, and of course, our crown jewel and executive director, Mario Cordero. And we wanted to just take the time to honor you and recognize you uh, by way of just uh, a token of appreciation, a certificate that we want to give to you. We're just going to take a picture and just um, along with your, the uh, your fellow celebrities, who's our communication groups, group who's here, Mario Gonzalez and Maria, um, and um, uh, I believe, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, that's the only two representatives we have our, from our communications division who have just dedicated tremendous amount of their talent, time, and treasure um, from the port, from the scholarship standpoint, from everything that you've done, you've really pioneered and paved the way for others to follow suit, and we're so grateful to you. Um, and the communications team, I just wanted to recognize you as well because you are the ones who are the behind the scenes who really make things happen. We just had our high school interns at the Port of Long Beach that we kicked off today. Was I picked up my interns, and it was quite exciting. This is the eighth year, is that right, that we're doing this at the Port of Long Beach, and it's been really, truly a leadership in the entire city and a model being used elsewhere. 
in the community and other entities who have um, joined. And you know, our community college students usually are, um, you know, unfortunately have been forgotten a, a lot of times. And um, just to have uh, an organization that recognizes the need to really support our, our students. There, you know, we have about one out of five of our students who are facing, facing housing insecurity and homelessness. And by way of you guys giving them the opportunities that you have, and 67% um, are qualify for uh, waivers when it comes to fee waivers. So it's, um, you're really helping the most vulnerable um, people in our society and really helping us uh, fulfill on our patriotic duty of uh, blessings, the, uh, securing the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity as our constitution contemplates. So with that, I just want to um, take the time, and I know we have some time constraints, and if, uh, if it's okay with the rest of the board that um, we recognize the um, port of... Uh, Long Beach and take a picture, but I wanted to also give an opportunity, if you'd like to say a few words, if you would like to speak before we do that, uh, Madam President, uh, welcome. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Romali, Superintendent, President. It is very auspicious that we are here this evening and being honored by you and in such amazing company as the brothers and sisters that are currently building our port. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. I very much appreciate the service of this board and I appreciate the vision of this college and the port appreciates the opportunity to be the partner that we have been and we look forward to continuing that. And I know that you have a very long meeting so I'm gonna let Mario, our crown jewel as you say, Madam President, now talk since he used to teach here, right, Mario? We don't need to talk about that, though. Do we? <laughs> thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you, President Zia, Superintendent President Romali, and the Board of Trustees. And again, under the leadership of President Yagashku, this commission uh, has really pushed the envelope on workforce development, which has resulted in a great opportunity that we have common ground. So for us as, the as a port, it's not just about creating jobs, it's about creating opportunities. And what inspiration did we have just this evening by listening to the stories of the men and women who just asked for an opportunity? And now you see the results of what that means to a worker, that what that one means to a laborer. So with that, I'll just conclude that thanks so much for the college for doing the job that you're doing. And as President Yashku said, we were very appreciative of the opportunity to collaborate with the college and on this great topic, it's been a great week. The Workforce Development Forum uh, that was ho hosted by Long Beach City College, as you know, the Association of American Port Authorities from back east was here, and it, has been, it was a great conference. And again, thank you so much. And with that, I will then get back to Madam President, because again, she's the one that has really led this issue of driving a commission to address opportunities in workforce development. And again, now we're seeing the fruits of not only what we are capable of doing, but what the future holds for us. Thank you. Thank you. Mario, Madam President, where, where would you like us to take our picture? Well, uh, before uh, we uh, take the picture, I just want to explain this beautiful picture that is up there. Um, I failed to do that. This is uh, our Maritime Center for, uh, for ex of Excellence that the port has uh, really given us the opportunity uh, and established at Long Beach City College. I presented on this at the AAPA conference, as uh, uh, Mr. Cordero mentioned earlier, and um, you've helped us train 100 students. That those are the tangible impacts and results you're having in the lives of our students, and we wanted to honor you and thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And um, if anybody else uh, would like to add to that, this is part of our College Promise 2.0 and we really wanted to honor and thank you for your leadership, Madam President. You've been a great partner to me um, and we've been, uh, it was, it's just been a fantastic ride and journey and I wanted to personally also thank you for your leadership and the incredible acumen you've demonstrated throughout this process. 
Uh, is there anybody else who'd like to say a few words before we go and take it? Yeah. Vice President Malaulu? Uh, first of all, I know we're on the subject of uh, recognizing the port. I just want to welcome everybody else, and uh, I will do a more formal welcome. Uh, but it is great to have the workers that are currently building the bridge and working on the port here when you are recognized. So I, I do agree with you that that is a, a really uh, perfect timing. I'm glad that you're both here. As far as the work in the Maritime Center of Excellence, um, the work that you've done with the college, um, I'm very grateful personally. I work on the ports as a longshore worker, so it's um, very important to me that both ports thrive. I live in Long Beach, so it's very important to my family that the Port of Long Beach thrives. And I would also like to thank you on behalf of our students, our faculty, and all of our many other partners, really for leading the way and just taking charge of this very important uh, project and program. Uh, I'd also like to encourage you to consider expanding upon it, to consider other opportunities, especially if they include our students and especially if they involve labor. So we can't discount the fact that you've got men and women working, and right now we're being faced with one of the biggest challenges of probably our time, generation, um, with automation that is displacing so many of our jobs. And it's not just my union as ILWU, but so many other unions here that are being affected by this, and we need to make sure that our children have jobs in the future. So every decision that you make and every program that comes across, you know, your desk, uh, Executive Director Mario and Board President Tracy, just, you know, always be considerate and compassionate and very conscientious of how that decision will impact the work for our kids. You heard so many 20 plus speakers today talk about families, and we've got children that we're educating that are going to need work jobs in the future. So make sure that you are consistent with that vision um, as we expand on these community partnerships. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Trustee Otto? Yeah, I want to congratulate you for this recognition. Also, um, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is your new port building uh, that's uh, under construction and I think will be opening pretty close to within 30 days and, uh, and you'll be able to occupy that. Probably people in this room have worked on that project. Uh, the city has a project labor agreement that uh, uh, allows uh, a lot of people to work and it's a, it's a fantastic building and I will be really glad to get you off of the Skylinks golf course right now, which is a, a, long, a long, long way from the water. You know, when Long Beach City College started the, the Long Beach College Promise, 10, 12, 12 years ago, I think it is now, um, what we said was it was very important for Long Beach City College, the Long Beach Unified School District, and Cal State Long Beach to partner to see that our students succeeded. Now, that's become a national movement. Uh, all over the country, there are college, uh, part, uh, college promises. But then when we added the city of Long Beach to that promise, we became unique. And then when we added the Port of Long Beach to that promise, we became super unique because nobody had an industry partner like that. And it's just paved the way for uh, the things that have been, uh, have been accomplished in the city. All you have to do is to look around in Long Beach and see all the uh, wonderful development that's going on. So thank you, congratulations, and uh, we look forward to the continuing this partnership. Chime in Trustee well. Hinta. Oh, thank you. Uh, great to have you both here and, and representatives from the port. Um, it's it's uh, interesting that growing up, I, it was always uh, Mr. Cordero or Coach Cordero uh, as a kid. So it's great to see uh, you here. And uh, I remember when you were on the Federal Maritime Commission, how gracious you were uh, to let me visit the, the facilities and a tour of your office. And it was really, I think, great for Long Beach to have one of, you know, you went from the, the Long Beach Harbor Commission to the National Harbor Commission, and it was really great to have um, that time and have you uh, serve in that role and then be able to bring those experiences and resources back here to keep the port running uh, fantastically as it is, and then for us to have this partnership. Uh, I know there's so many uh, young students to talk about. I want to get into logistics. I want to work at the port. I want to know how to bring things from around the world or send things out that I make, and it's just 
Nowhere else do you have this close proximity and this partnership between our joint public agencies that we're both serving the same community, that we're you know, doing the double investment, that we're getting more back because we're doing the grants to the community for air quality, that we're doing the educational uh, pro programs, that the tours out in the, in the harbor are uh, uh, a big uh, draw. And I know, our, I think our faculty want to schedule one uh, in the near future. Uh, but it's, it's just great to continue to have uh, the partnerships we have and expand on it. Uh, I know uh, Tracy's one of my uh, constituents, so it's great to have a, a fantastic constituent doing so much that you do. Uh, and I know it's, you know, when you're in public service, it's a service of love uh, and you're really giving back your time, your treasure, your talent to make the community a better place. So I, I thank you for that and look forward to expanding the Maritime Center. We were in D.C. Uh, working on the, getting the federal designation uh, so we can partner with the, the, the Federal Maritime Academy uh, Training Center. So uh, excited to see what's on the horizon for us. So thank you again for your leadership and your support for Long Beach City College. Trustee Baxter. Yes, um, good evening. Um, I want to salute you, the Port of Long Beach, uh, and in particular you, Tracy, and, and Mario. Uh, but I also want to thank the Port for, I think, tripling the number of scholarships that uh, you gave, the, but Maria's shaking her head, so she knows better than I do, from the Port. Uh, you're a long, long time supporter, I would say probably 25 years, and so um, you're putting your money where your mouth is, which is very important to me, and I, I appreciate it very much, and this is so vital to our students, plus offering internships, and thank you very much. Thank you, we will now go up front and take a picture, and um, thank you all for being here. separate shots. Three, no, eight and three. Eight and three? If there's eight people, we're going to do three shots. Okay. So you, I'll just give it Thank you, everyone. All right. All right. Believe it or not, we are um, uh, going back to Superintendent President's report again, because I believe she has other items to report on. And thank you, everyone, for your patience. We have certainly appreciate it. Madam uh, President? Thank you, Madam President. Um, we have eight more recognitions that we would like to do. And our first up will be presented by Vice President Vivian Malaulu to Meng Yang, an LBCC student. Okay. 
Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Um, before I uh, bring Meng up for his recognition, I want to say a few things about him, and then I want to read something to you. Um, first of all, uh, and, and I, I hope I don't mispronounce this, but um, Meng Yang is, and I got some, I did some homework, and I got some bio information. I hope it's accurate. Uh, my fact checker was actually not available, so I had to do it myself. Um, so I've got that you are of, can you pronounce that for me? Is it Hmong descent? Did I say that correctly? Okay, Hmong right. descent. He's 25 years old and he is a current Viking. He's pursuing an um, Associate of Science degree in Automotive Technology and Film, Radio and Television, so dual major. As an Asian American, he feels that there's a lack of outreach to the Cambodian community, although he is not Cambodian. He feels connected to all Asians, wants to help make a difference. However, he can because he believes that the Asian community in Long Beach is underrepresented. Meng is an emancipated youth who is part of the Next Step and Guardian Scholar Program. He's currently in our student government and on the automotive club. And that's actually how he popped up on my radar. And I'll explain that in just a second. Um, he's a strong advocate for Next Step and the Guardian Scholar Programs. He helped both programs get established. He advocated to helping bring back the automotive program by reaching out, speaking to alumni, former students, various club members on campus, and he was also instrumental in having the automotive program approved at the state level by the chancellor's office. So you could see why this particular recognition is um, very dear to me. Um, not only is he an academic, but he's in student government, um, but he's also part of our uh, returning trades programs. So this is how he popped up on my radar. And this was sent to me by one of our staff members. Um, bear with me for one second while I read to you what she wrote, asking if there was some way that we could recognize his um, effort. So um, on, I believe it was April 7th, there was a Cambodian outreach event at Mark Twain Library. And when this particular staff member, and, and by the way, her name is Julie Sophia Daniels. Is Julie here? Is Julie here? Are you here, Julie? There you are. Well, thank you very much, Julie. I really appreciate you helping me um, get this um, to happen. Uh, so she arrived at Mark Twain Library at approximately 9 a.m. Meng was already there. He had a table and canopy set up. They spoke briefly. She discovered that he was there alone, representing the automotive club. She checked on him periodically throughout the day, gave him water and food since there was no one there to relieve him. Later in the day, for some reason, we don't know why, the canopy was removed. He continued to sit at the table in the sweltering heat alone. While his face was red, sweat was continuously streaming down his face. Julie checked on him, asked if he needed a break, if she wanted to, uh, him to, to, her to relieve him while he uses the restroom, Go goes, grabs food, he declined. Um, somebody actually did take some food to him from Sophie's food booth. Um, she, uh, Julie had mentioned to one of their staff earlier, um, she had provided him with a Thai iced tea. He never left the table. Even after the crowd died down, other vendors were closing, he stayed there and spoke with anyone who visited the table, gave them information about the automotive program, was very polite, respectful, and knowledgeable. He was there from before the program started until it ended without a break. He was in the hot sun without relief. Um, friendly, respectful, never complained. And it is my pleasure, Meng, to honor you today at today's meeting, not only for that, for that one day of selfless giving, but for all the work that you've done. And Dario, you've got some pictures up. Okay, good. I didn't see those pictures that went up. But uh, I was able to locate some pictures. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm, it's like CSI here. I did a little investigative work, and I just want to recognize you, and I hope the rest of you could please join me in giving one of our students a big hand for his work. Come on up, we'll take a photo.
matter what circumstance. Okay, the next group that I would like to come up and go ahead and, as your name is called, go ahead and stand up here and we'll present you with your certificates and take a photo. And that is our presentation of checks and acknowledgement of our president's ambassadors. Gina Jimenez, Edwin Martinez, Jennifer Baker, Christina Blaskova, Christian Ariaga, Fabiola Guerrera Paredes, Melanie Rojas, Vanessa de Guzman, Mackenzie Eggy, John Paulo Contreras, Brian Vane, Shannon Syracuse, Antonio Ruiz, and Edgar Garibay. Please come forward and be recognized and receive your checks. Congratulations and thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you so much. We'd also like to make our next recognition. As your name is, ca is called, please come forward so that we can acknowledge you. Jorge Ochoa, Academic Senate President, who is the outgoing Senate, being, Senate President being recognized for his term in office. Annie Engel, Classified Senate President being recognized for the end of her term in office. Kirsten Moreno, Faculty Association President, recognizing her end of term. Susan Trask, Classified Union, recognizing her end of term. David C., Citizens Oversight Committee Chair, recognizing his end of term, and Brendan Hayes, the manager who we are recognizing retirement of 20 years of service. And Dr. Kathy Scott will give a special uh, item to Jorge Ochoa. Right now?
Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I know uh, we have a lot of people here, and I know that we didn't have a request to reorder the agenda, but I'm going to go, uh, go ahead and hear item 4.1 before the other items on the reports. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Point of order. Point of order. I, I mean, we, we didn't have a motion to do that, and we do need that um, for parliamentary purposes. Um, can we continue with the reports, the bargaining unit reports? I would just request that the board, because they, we, uh, honor, we honor the time of folks who are here. I know a lot of the, our uh, brothers and sisters who are here uh, have been up since 4 a.m. and they go to work early. So I just want to be mindful of that, if that's okay with the rest of the board, that we go ahead and um, move that item ahead of uh, other. Like a motion? Sure. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Baxter. Um, all in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay then, we have formally <laughs> moved up item 4.1. Superintendent President Dr. Molly, would you like to kick off item 4.1? And thank you everyone for your patience and uh, we're gonna try to be as uh, efficient as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Better. Uh, we're extremely excited to introduce this motion to be at this point that we're presenting to you today with an updated and expanded project labor agreement that does the following. It proposes to add eight new projects to the agreement, which more than doubles the existing agreement for a total of $342 million in additional estimated construction costs. Our original agreement passed in 2016 for an amount of 156 and a half million. This new agreement adds 342 million to that for a total of $498.5 million. The agreement covers an additional 10 years. It, it proposes an addition of LBCC student graduates in related programs, and the Los Angeles, Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council reviewed and agreed with the proposed amendment. The CSWPA amendment was pursued in response to input from the Board of Trustees at our facilities committee meeting on March 12th. We uh, staff were directed to explore options to expand the agreement with additional projects and to include LBCC student graduates in related programs, very exciting. Um, the Board of Trustees met on March 27th and based on the facilities committee recommendation, the board directed me to enhance and expand the CSWPA within 10 years. Negotiations then ensued between Ron Miller and VP Drinkwine. The Board of Trustees met on April 24th and VP Drinkwine provided an exciting update on the progress, including the neighboring community college district's PLA thresholds with a commitment to bring back the item for the board's consideration at the June meeting. On May 31st, we provided an, an executive summary to the board, which include the current projects, expanded list of neighboring CCDs and their PLA thresholds, a negotiated contract amendment, and a notation that the expansion would be for 10 years. So I wanted to let you know how hard uh, the board has been working on this so, they, so we can acknowledge, I really want to acknowledge the board's hard work on this. So that is an introduction to the item. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Do I have a motion? I think we already made a motion. To reorder. Or to reorder. I'm sorry. So move. Moved by Trustee Baxter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Intook. Are there any questions? Yes, President Zia, I have a couple. Trustee Baxter? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to say I was a member of, of the teachers' union for 20 years, so I'm very supportive of, of unions and, and believe very much in uh, what they do and uh, in taking care of our people. My question is, uh, this labor agreement does not expire for two years, and then we're seeking 
a, um, an extension of another 10 years. Why are we doing it at this time, or what is the justification of doing it at this time and not waiting uh, for the two years near the expiration date? Yes, D.P. Drinkwine, would you kindly help us? Thank you. Um, there are two primary reasons we brought this to the board at this time. The first is that we will be breaking ground very shortly in the upcoming fall on two of the last projects contained in the current agreement. And as you know, construction planning takes a considerable amount of time, and as we start to plan the next projects, knowing what projects are subject to the PLA does make a difference in how we move forward with those. And secondly, by looking at the amendment today, we had the opportunity with the expansion of our trades programs to roll in students into the amendment when they were not previously included. Okay, thank you. Any other board members who have questions? I, I have a few. Vice President Malaulu. So um, I would also like to as we discuss this project labor agreement, the, the amendment to it, I would also like to once again welcome all of the members of the building trades who are here and thank you for being here. Um, you are, I consider, my brethren in the labor movement. I am a card-carrying, dues-paying, meeting-attending union member and I know how important these agreements are. And Every single one of you who spoke said absolutely the right thing. I commend you for being here, for thinking about the future, thinking about families, thinking about work, especially those of you who are from Long Beach. So you absolutely said the right thing. Now, I have to tell you that um, when the issue of the amendment first came up, my instant knee-jerk reaction was, yeah, why not, absolutely. Let's expand it, let's make it bigger and better. And that's the labor in me. That's who I am, that's in my DNA, and I don't think that will ever change. However, I had to do my due diligence and put on my trustee hat as a person sitting on this dais with the fiduciary responsibility to this college and to the residents of Long Beach who voted for this tremendous amount of money in the form of a bond measure. And this is probably one of the most difficult projects that I've had to undertake since I became a board member. And some of my discovery has been a little concerning to me, and it didn't help. Um, in fact, I remember it was Father's Day, uh, Sunday, June 16th. There was an article in the Orange County Register that talked about um, construction jobs and work, you, you probably are familiar with it. It wasn't a favorable article, and I think that after that article, let me, I can tell you what the title of it was. Um, I started doing a little bit more homework. It was worker shortage hits construction trades, and it talked about project labor agreements, and it talked about um, some of the fiscal uh, problems that we'll be facing. Um, to be honest, under this current administration and some of the projects. And all of a sudden, the labor in me had to become a little more aware of the trustee in me having to investigate further. Um, some of the things that I'm concerned about, and, and I'll be honest with you, there's, there is one thing that I am concerned about. Sometimes I think that the expansion might not even be big enough, that maybe we could expand it even a little bigger. So that, those are some of my original thoughts. But the fact that this is the first time that this item has been agendized and it's the first opportunity that this board has to actually discuss it and to talk about it, um, it just doesn't sit well with me. Um, Vice President Drinkwine, can I just ask one question? How many facility subcommittees meetings were there? We have had one. Okay, you had one meeting um, where the amendment was, from my understanding after speaking to staff, it was, and one of the words that I have here, haphazardly discussed with no intentionality, everything was just thrown in there. Um, some of the projects, for example, building MM project, 
was originally not included in the list and that project received public funding and then it was thrown back on the list um, as of this morning. And, and this is where me being a trustee comes into play. This is where Brown Act comes into play. This is where me having to answer to the voters who I asked to vote for this bond measure comes into play. And please understand that. Please understand that. There's a fight in me between a labor person and a trustee. The labor person says, yeah, approve it, approve it now, ask no questions, take no prisoners, do it. But the trustee in me is looking at an email that we got this morning at 11.28 in the morning making additional amendments to the amendment that we've only seen once on the agenda. I have a problem with that. I have to answer to people who I called asking them to vote for this bond measure. We have a bond oversight committee and I don't want to be the person that's on the hot seat because I am a labor person and everybody knows that I'm a labor person, I don't want to be the person on the hot seat with somebody saying, Vivian, you voted something up because you're a labor person with total disregard for the residents of Long Beach, with total disregard for the errors that were made. In fact, um, Vice President Dinkwine, Drinkwine, I'm, I'm quoting your email that says, we discovered minor errors in the original projects listed in the amendment. That email came at 11.28 today. So with this motion on the floor, I'd like to speak against the motion to give this board the opportunity to get it right and to truly give you guys an amendment that doesn't have errors, that's not gonna put the college in the bite, that won't put this board in the bite for rushing. This project, we signed the agreement on April 26, 2016. It's a five-year contract until 2021. Today is June of 2019. We're nowhere near. Vice President Drinkwine said that the reason that we're rushing is because we're breaking ground on two projects in the fall and we need time to plan. I'm sorry, but that has very little relevance to us expanding on a project that the amendment comes to us for the first time this is the first time it's come before this board as is. The subcommittee's facilities meeting met once. I was on the trades advisory meeting when I was a faculty member here on that committee. We met regularly. They met one time. So while I know that you guys have been invited here, expecting to have this amendment approved right off the bat, and I love that you're here and you're welcome here anytime, I think you need to understand that it has errors, it has flaws, it's haphazard, it's missing information. And I mean, I, I've got, talk about the interest of time. This is two pages worth of items that I found and I did my research speaking to different staff members and people on the project. In fact, you know, I, I, was, in, I was even told that some of our staff was even bypassed in this. Some of our admin was even bypassed in the way this um, amendment was, in, was introduced that it was more of a board decision without the consensus of the entire board. Um, I, I would like to propose a friendly amendment that we postpone this, uh, accept adopting this amendment to where the board has more time to do its due diligence, more research, that these corrections that were emailed to us at 11.28 a.m., that our copies are everywhere, that you guys have been given copies, have an opportunity to properly be integrated into the amendment and that we have time to digest it. It's the right thing to do as a labor person. Yeah, you know, I wish it wasn't that way, but as a trustee who has a responsibility to this institution, that's the right thing to do. Vice President Malahulu, you have made some plaints there and charges that I'd like to address. Um, no board member has been negotiating this on behalf of the board. We had our committee subcommittee meeting. We came back to you in March on March 12th, on March 27th. We all directed staff to go ahead and extend this contract this amendment, this existing amendment to include our existing bond as contemplated in the original 
agreement. And for you to bring this up, I mean, what would you expect us to do? I mean, do you want us to go ahead and go into detail and look at the negotiations and the project list? Uh, it's, is, is it uh, correct that this is something that has been already approved uh, and uh, concurred with and uh, by our counterpart party? That is correct, that our counterpart has read the language and has agreed to the language. Okay, and then just for the record, you also made the charge that the public didn't have the ability to know. There has been ample opportunity. This, this has been sunshined, 100 copies and plus has been made to the members of the public. So I do take umbrage with what you're saying, and I am not only surprised, but disappointed that you would want to delay this item and deny the students here that is in as part of this amendment that will give the opportunity. Not only all these men and women who are here supporting it, um, and there's been no expectation built that it's a done deal, it's the desire of the board. But for you to suggest that, I think, is um, quite disappointing. Um, everything we hear here, I mean, I, I don't remember hearing the previous PLA multiple times. I don't remember uh, going into the nitty gritty of which projects. It is the decision, it is the recommendation the staff is bringing before us based on negotiations that they have made with our binding contract agreement should there be a contract amendment, which I fully support. I think this is a prudent thing to do. We have 16 projects that uh, men and women working in this community deserve to have a right to work on. It supports our students, it supports local hire. Not only that, as, as, as someone who's in the industry of construction, I could tell you the difference between a non-PLA project and a PLA project, and what a good PLA looks like and what it does. And this is a good PLA. You, we heard from the leadership, from labor. This is something that provides quality and certainty on time, on budget, and makes sure that we don't have labor disputes. I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. It's priceless. So I, I am all in favor of it. I don't believe there should be delay to this item. It's been months. We, when we first brought this up to you in March, you had no concerns. You didn't bring up any concerns. The, the draft amendment was sent to you on May 31st. Is that correct, staff? To the entire board. You, I didn't, I did, did, was there any questions on which projects to add or not, staff? Did any board member direct you to negotiate or uh, uh, insert language? We had no questions on the extension of the projects or the length of time or the inclusion of students. We did have questions regarding uh, additional um, partnerships, but not to the projects reflected in the um, agreement. Okay, great. So with that, I wanna say that I, I give my full hearted support for this. I don't think the hardworking men and women in this community deserve any delay. This is not rushed, there's been a, quite a bit of deliberation, and it's not our job to get into the weeds. Let me remind us of that as board members. That is a job of staff. We're not involved in the operations. We are policy makers and we approve. And if you have questions, let's talk about those questions and we can deliberate, discuss, and resolve it. And I, I think we should support this and I have, you have my full commitment that I, I am behind you, brothers and sisters of labor, that this is a good agreement and I agree with it. Are there any other board members who would like Trustee to speak? Otto, may I, I think. <laughs> Trustee Zia, may I ask um, Last time President I checked, Trey. I didn't have a sex change. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Trustee Baxter. No, I'm sorry, you're, you're much prettier than Trustee Otto. Um, Thank you. In the agreement that we agreed to, did it say 13, did it say 13 years? Because I don't remember, I do remember this. I was actually at the facilities meeting as a guest, not as a voting member, but I was curious as to what was going on. 
And I don't remember, because I think I would have questioned it right then and there. At the facilities subcommittee meeting, the conversation was regarding um, exploring the level of expansion with the threshold, as well as the inclusion of the students. It, in subsequent meetings, we brought back a comparison um, first with LACCD's threshold, and a meeting after that with further um, neighboring community college districts thresholds for a comparison of what that looked out like. And it was during the course of those meetings that there were further direction on looking at length of expansion, the number of projects, the type of projects. It was during the course of the negotiation um, with the Trades Council um, that I think it was described that um, they didn't get exactly what they wanted and we didn't get exactly what we wanted, but we ended up at some place between um, that we looked at the expansion of the number of projects um, versus uh, looking at a threshold. So, so we identified a specific number of projects. So the projects drove the timeline? Correct. Okay, and I, I have to say uh, this amendment with including the students is vital because when I was reading the percentages, the number of local workers is, is not that high in the whole scheme of things in every report from the Solis uh, company. And I, I wish Joe Carroll were here tonight because I was going to ask him uh, some clarification on, on these. Can, may I ask yeah, uh, Vice President Drinkwine? if perhaps you know the answers to this? I think we have another representative from uh, Solis Group, correct? Uh, Okay. And oh, good. Yeah, if you don't mind going up to the podium, and then I may call up on other members or counterparty um, counterpart in case they want to speak to it. So just for the public, the Solis Group oversees to make sure that um, the 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 contractors are hiring per people in the unions and and they're uh, legitimate and all those kinds of things. Um, when. When you report, in your report, uh, total local workers, where do those workers reside? And for instance, in one of the examples, it was 38 workers. Um, what is your definition of local worker as opposed to the zip codes which were also listed? Are those one and the same or are those different? Um, the local workers, and I, I apologize, I'm Jeremy Turner, I'm filling in for Joe. Uh, the local workers are made up of the zip code list in the PLA. Uh, the, the local area is made up of the district. Uh, then it expands to the gateway cities. Uh, then it expands to all of LA County. Uh, veterans are also counted uh, mm -hmm. as part of the, the first tier part of the district. Um, so yeah, I think on our last report, I think for the building P project, we had 59.8% total local. Uh, which would then be broken down into 9.8% district, 14.1% uh, gateway. Those combined to be about, a, let's see, 23.91%, and then the rest of that would just be okay. LA County. And that's where I'm getting at, because the, the zip code number was, was relatively low, 9, 10% of all the workers. What is the definition of local workers? Uh, definition of local would be all of LA County of and LA veterans, County. correct. Okay. So it's not Long Beach. Yeah. It includes Long Beach, uh, including including Long Beach and correct. our students. Correct. Correct. Oh, the, the student you. the students would be included in the amendment, uh, but the uh, yeah students is if they don't reside within Long Beach, then they wouldn't count. Now currently. there's a good question in your new report after this agreement is made. Mm -hmm. Will there be a special category listing students, or will they be thrown into whatever zip code they live? Um, they would be included in the the district residents in the first tier, but we could certainly also break that out so that you know how many how many are individually are specifically students. Well, I think that would be an important fact to know because Absolutely. a lot of our students don't live within the district. They might live in, well, all kinds of places because right. they're coming here because of the programs that we offer and anybody in the state of California can go to any community college they wish. Right. Um, I would like to see that just, you know, as, as a report figure. But thank you, thank you for being here and for that clarification. Thank you. Yeah, this, this, this agreement, what I personally love, that it takes it farther because it puts our students first. Um, and it seems that it's, it, it's been quite thought out. Are there any other trustees that would like to speak to the item or any questions? 
Trustee Antuk. Uh Yeah, uh, thank you for everybody who came out. This is a really important item. Um, this is something that uh, is, uh, I wanna see happen. Um, this is something that uh, I was the one that uh, recommended creating the facilities committee uh, so that we could start talking about construction projects, schedules, what's co covered under the PLA, what's not. Because last summer we were going through our um, construction you know, five-year plan and saying, well, oh, that one's not covered? Well, what, which one is covered? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, pro the, the first uh, agreement, I like to think of it as a baby PLA, <laughs> that it was um, a little, about 10 projects and $150 million, um, five-year agreement um, that was done before I, I was here, or, uh, a couple of us were here. Uh, and so um, my goal is to expand and so when we had the facility committee meeting i had hoped we had more uh, i tried to get a meeting in november and december uh, and we weren't able to i think until february or, uh, to have the meeting um, to really to have time because we get to these meetings and there's so much on the agenda and we're always time constrained um, but at that meeting and i was looking through the um, um, what exactly did we um, say so from the sub, from facility subcommittee meeting, we made a recommendation to the full board uh, to ask the superintendent president to evaluate the student perform and the community and student workforce agreement and report back. And that was the consensus vote on March 27th. So this is the first time it's coming back to the board mm -hmm. since March. So and, and actually as a as a point of order. Um, the item on that agenda was listed as an informational item. Mm -hmm. We had quite a discussion as to whether on an informational item you could take some kind of action of any kind, and uh, I still don't know exactly I was, how that I was concerned about that as well, and I explicitly asked it to be an action item. I even went to the extent to utilize one of the board policies that any trustee can put an item on the agenda, and it should be agendized the way that it was requested and that was not fulfilled uh, at the meeting. But we still had it on the meeting and I was told that information item or not, we could still give uh, direction, but we couldn't make, we didn't make any amendments, we didn't have any seconds or anything, but it was about directing the superintendent to look at enhancing, expanding and enhancing were the two items, I mean, uh, of what, what to do and report back. So to me, tonight is the first report back that we've had since that meeting back in March. Um, I, I wanna see this get done, but I'm troubled by the emails today of w do we have the right projects? I had a meeting on Monday that had a whole different list of $66 million in projects, and now we have another list today. This is too important to mix up. And, and, I, and, I, and I expressed my frustration to staff both on Monday and today uh, that how do we get in the situation that uh, these errors are being made? Because I read newspapers too, and I remember reading an article about the Clippers uh, uh, arena in Inglewood and lawsuits are happening because things weren't followed right. And to me, the most important thing is to do this right because I don't wanna mess it up. It's too important to the community. And I, I agree, you know, we, we're not at running out of the agreement now, but I think we need to do this right. And, and I, I, I'm troubled by the, the errors and mistakes that have happened the last couple of days. Trustee Antuk, uh, what would have been different, uh, and, and you know, other trustees, what would have been different? You know, this is something we can't get into the weeds. I mean, what would you like to do? Do a validation of the projects with the building trades, or what, what, are, what are you expecting? Uh, what else do, you, do we need? Uh, staff has negotiated with the building trades, building trades have concurred with the updated project list that the value hasn't changed, it triples our PLA. What else is there left for us to do? I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused as to why, I mean, these are the kind of arguments um, that I've heard, frankly, opposition members just to PLAs make. People who don't want to pose and they grapple at whatever excuse they can find a reason. Um, I'm not suggesting you're necessarily going that route, but it seems familiar. 
And um, I just want to know what would be different um, if you had a different project list or if it was, yeah. well, <laughs> you know, it's like I, I don't understand why we need to delay and deny these workers the opportunity to work on it right now. We, when, if you recall in March when we brought this back, I do remember you wanted to bring back an item from the subcommittee and you wanted the entire board to vote. That would have been premature. We didn't have the item before us to, to vote on and it wasn't deliberated. In fact, Trustee Otto, I remember you objected. You said, you know what, what are we voting on here? And the recommendation was to enhance and expand the PL and bring it back in May. It wasn't ready in May. Now it's coming back in June because it's ready. Therefore, I'm just at a loss. What's the problem, folks? You are put, hanging your hat on form over substance, <laughs> substance that we can't really get involved in. And I, I, I take exception to that. And I don't think all these men and women here who are here, they get up at four in the morning, they shouldn't be denied the work. They shouldn't be... De what, are, what are we... Excuse me, I still have the floor, Vice President Malauulu. Why are we delaying the opportunity in our students? We should have done this yesterday. The question is why? That's all I have to say. Vice President Malauulu. Thank you. So a couple of times you used the word deny. Let me be clear, nobody is denying you anything. There is nothing we want more than to approve this project, but we want to give you a good project. We don't want to give you a project that has flaws. We don't want to give you a project that we were still trying to hammer out at 1128 this morning. We, that's not right. So I get it. You guys were invited to a party and you're all dressed up and you're here, but the pinata is not ready. The birthday cake is not baked yet. I understand, and there are expectations because I've heard from some of you. I have heard from some of you that you were invited to be here, which is great. I invite you to come to every single board meeting moving forward. But if I'm going to deliver something to you, I'm going to deliver something that I'm going to be proud of, that I could stand by, that's not going to have flaws, that's not going to have questions, that's not going to put the people that we begged we begged, I phone banked for this bond measure. I put my reputation and my integrity on the line to pass this bond measure. I went to people who are already overtaxed in this city, who have to pay taxes upon taxes upon taxes, to ask them to give us more money in taxes. And if I'm gonna deliver something, I'm gonna deliver a really quality product. It, it's gonna be well done. As of Monday, Trustee Untuck said that he had issues as of Monday. We have the vice president of facilities here who emailed us today with amendments. I mean, come on, you guys. I get it. You guys are here. Your expectations are high. And I would be, too. As a labor person, if my contract was on the table, I don't blame you. I would be, too. I, I agree with you. But as a trustee on this board, is, I have a question for you. Is there anything on this amendment that addresses our homeless students or any kind of construction for homeless students? Because that was something that we discussed earlier. Is there anything on here? I know that we talked about the North Long Beach land facility and expanding our college. I mean, maybe we'll come back with an even bigger project. Maybe it'll be expanded further. Maybe there'll be more opportunity. But give us a chance to, to, to get it right I, I don't understand what the hurry is. The, we're in a, you know, Trustee Baxter asked, what's the hurry? The hurry is because we're breaking ground on two projects from a previous bond measure. That's not reason enough to push something through that's not done right. I would rather delay it for a couple more months, give the administration, get ha the, the facility subcommittee met one time. And according to staff, because I did ask, according to staff, we had, it wasn't even staff that invited some of the members that were attending that meeting. It was trustees that invited members attending that meeting. I'm sorry, but that's not protocol. Talk about getting in the weeds. You want to talk about we don't get in the weeds to do that? Well, if we don't get in the weeds, then we don't invite people to our subcommittees for our college. We let the staff do that. So if you want to talk about getting in the weeds, let's go all the way back to the beginning. 
We requested to have an action item. We requested to have information. This is the first time this item makes our agenda. This is the first time. And as of five hours ago, there was a, an error that was discovered. Be reasonable. And the word deny keeps being said. How could you give people, how could you deny them the opportunity? No one's denying you anything. You're getting a rain check to come back when it's a better table setting for you, where you will actually get a deliverable that this board could stand behind, that the administration could stand behind, that no attorney is going to sue us over, that we're not going to get a lawsuit screaming down our faces because we rushed for no reason. We've got time. This isn't expiring. There's no timeline for it. Give us an opportunity to do it right. And then, and then you can get dressed up and come back to the party. And then you'll get a, a, we'll throw you a real party. We'll have a cake, a real cake. But the expectation that we're going to push something through, we have, we have to answer to voters and money and budgets and things that are, to be honest with you, they were over my head for a very long time. And it wasn't until I had to sit on this side of the table that I understood the importance and the significance of getting little tiny things like this right. These little contracts were over my head for a very long time. But now that I have to sit there and agree on them, you know, it's a huge responsibility. So it's kind of neat that I come from the other side of the table and now I have to sit on this side because I understand your frustration. I used to work nights. I got off at 3 o'clock in the morning lots of times. So I get that you've been awake. But even, even as a labor person, I want a bargaining agreement. I want some kind of MOU that's done right, that's not flawed, and perhaps could have an opportunity to even be bigger and to have a little bit more expansion to it. Homeless housing, maybe. The North Long Beach facility, maybe. Let's add a little bit. If we have the budget today, you know what today is? You know what's on our agenda after you guys leave? The budget. Don't you think the optics of that look bad? We're going to have a, a budget presentation after you guys are all gone. So let, let's get the pulse of what's happening with the college finances today. Let's see where the budget of the college is. How did we do? Are we in the red? I just think it would be very irresponsible to push through an agreement that was haphazardly and hastily put together. Case in point, I got an email at 11.28 today that discovered errors. Be reasonable, please. Thank you, Vice President Malauulu. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. Miller to speak to, if you're okay with these uh, so-called errors or if they're... Um, and what are your thoughts, and since you have been working with our staff, and I can certainly not speak to the details. Mr. Miller. Okay, so the agreement I have in front of me, we did negotiate language for your students. They are uh, considered in the first tier, along with the veterans, no matter where they live. So they're first tier local hire. As far as the... Uh, the project list, it is what it is. There's language in the original agreement that allows board members and the district to add projects as they see fit. So when you come up with your homeless uh, project, you got the money, you got the funding, you got the green light, you can add it by a vote or with the approval of the district. That's always been in there. You can add any project you want. What we're after We've put together a good program with the MC3 program and a partnership with your college, and we need commitments. These project, this project list is a commitment that we're going to continue to build upon that program. The business managers that I work for, they have a very delicate balancing act as to how many people they bring into their programs. They have to see the work in front of them in order to bring the folks in. You just can't bring people in and have them sit on the out-of-work bench. They don't make very happy customers, and those business managers have to run for election. So if they get too many people out of work that they can't keep working, they get unelected. So it's a very delicate balancing act. So we're constantly having to show the business managers the work that we have out in front of us. So a 10-year agreement like we have at the Port of Los Angeles, like we have with Metro, like we have at LAUSD, that gives us some uh, stability 
keep bringing people into our apprenticeship program. Do you think we should delay, Mr. Miller? I don't think so. Thank you. But I'm not voting on it. You are. Thank you. Are there any other trustees that would like to speak to the item before I call on the vote? Trustee Otto. You know, I, I think I was responsible for the amendment that came in this morning because a couple of days ago I said, I'm concerned about this list. The list doesn't seem accurate to me. And uh, to her credit, uh, Vice President Drinkwine um, jumped on it right away and looked and did find some errors. Um, but as I looked more and more at this, um, I was more concerned than I was because even with the uh, w with the, the amendments that came in very late, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because this isn't what the public was informed of. This is something that's different from that, and I'm still concerned about what we even got today. For example, uh, of the 17, 16 projects, one of them is listed as the security systems. That's item number one. It's already completed. So it really shouldn't be on the list at all. Uh, item number two has to do with building P. It was an $8.4 million project. That project is completed too. Um, uh, project three, building J, is 60% complete now, so it's not a new project. Uh, project four, the outdoor kinesiology laboratory, and I think that should have been combined with the aquatic center, which is five. The design's nearly complete on that. Uh, it's gonna go out uh, for bid in a couple of months. Same on building MM, which is number six. Um, on item number seven, the parking structure has already been awarded. <laughs> um, the uh, class, number eight, the classroom building, which is identified as PCC00, and I think that just got changed. The name of it, the numbers just got changed today. I think that's the same thing as number 13. The way I, I looked at this, we have a, well, this is a new project labor agreement. Two of the projects are done. Five of them are already underway. Um, two others were on, beyond that was on the, were on the original list. And so we don't have much of what I would hope for in a new project, uh, project labor agreement. I would like to see a, a, a 10 new projects uh, listed, vetted, put on and I don't I'm not suggesting that you kick this down the road for a year or six months or something like that I I just think that uh, uh, it needs to have been done better another thing that I didn't see mentioned in the documents at all was well and, and by the way we don't it's this isn't students this is student graduates and um, so you have to have graduated from program to even get on the list and that's not a very uh, big list, but there's no mention as far as I can see about small businesses. And with agreements like this, what happens is big businesses can do this kind of work, but what happens to the little guys? They can be uh, subcontractors to big ones, but I don't think that it is adequately addressed. And uh, Trustee Malaulu is absolutely right that this is the first time we've really had a chance to, uh, to work with it. So um, uh, I... I think that I, I, I was very much in favor of the first agreement and worked very hard to get it into, in fact, we had a unanimous vote on it. And I, I believe that this agreement, this proposed agreement is rushed. I think that the first building that would be a new building under this project isn't even gonna be uh, done or start, I mean, I don't mean done, but I mean actually even started until 2021. So if we put this over for a couple months, brought it back and said, let's sit down and work together not to change the lion's share of the agreement, but to make it a better agreement with more projects, that it would be better. Mr. Miller, would you like to respond to that? Um, the, language does say the language does say student graduates is what Mr. Miller said for the record. Um, you know, I, I find it fascinating, you know, I mean, uh, that we're trying to let perfect be the enemy of good. 
you know, if you guys want to bring it under your leadership, PLA 2.0 later, add something else, we always have that opportunity to keep, continue to expand these, this agreement and make it better and better and perfect it. We're not looking for perfection here. Let's work with something. And just like the first one wasn't perfect, what I ask the board to consider is that, look, we didn't even have a subcommittee when we first had our first agreement done. Facility subcommittee is something that I established to give us a little bit more visibility. And it was properly noticed. I do think it's not appropriate for board members to be shouting their discontent. This is a, we have to have a civil discourse about this. We did have a, a subcommittee meeting. I, I never call people and lobby people to come to subcommittee meetings. It's properly noticed. And folks did show up. So, you know, you're just, you know, trying to grasp at whatever you can. For whatever reason, you don't want to do this now. It's disappointing. And, you know, I don't know what is going to make you guys happy and right, make it right, look right. We, you can, you're certainly more than welcome to make an amendment with all the changes and all the ch issues that you have with it. And I will welcome any of you to, to make, that, make that suggestion and second it. Are there anybody who wants to bring their changes and make a motion to make this as perfect as you'd like? Yes, I'd like uh, to propose a motion. I know there's already a motion and a second on the floor. We're in discussion. So a friendly amendment that we postpone this and send it back to staff. And Trustee Otto just gave a list of errors a, a list, he, he outlined, I counted eight, I don't know if I missed any, but there were eight items that he mentioned that were either complete, wrong, omitted. So I'd like to have it in writing that we could review, sent back to us when staff has the opportunity to get that to us. Well, we have a motion um, already on the floor. In a second, Mr. Miller, would you like to speak? Well, like would you please go to the podium? I think maybe some of you are confusing the list. The list you have in front of you that with the new amendment, it has the existing uh, projects from the original agreement plus the new ones. So some of them are completed. That's not a mistake. That's, that's we deleted the original list and this is the new list. It includes the projects that were already built, started, completed, and new projects that haven't been done yet. Now whether, the explanation, the names are right or wrong, I don't know. But the list is all together so that it shows the history and the future. And I understand that. I, I do understand that. But what I'm saying is that I think that the, the agreement can be made better and it can have many, many more projects because we've got the ability to do that and, and we, should, we should do that. That, that was only my Okay, what other projects would you like to add, Mr. Otto? Excuse me? What, what projects would you like to add? You have certainly the opportunity to add them tonight. Why should we wait? This, this is uh, inappropriate. Why is it inappropriate? Why, I mean, if you have any projects that you see that is missing, please add them a, by a friendly amendment. You have that ability. By what you're trying to do. Uh, there's plenty of, if we, if we put our, our shoulders... I'm sorry, I, I, if you don't mind speaking to the microphone, um, you, you don't want to dignify, what am I trying to do? I'm, I'm trying to make, sh make sure that your concern is addressed. You have a concern that doesn't have all the accurate projects. You guys had this draft agreement since uh, May 31st. You have ample time to review it and provide those commentaries, and you failed to. So what's, what's wrong? I mean, or if you have anything, any, any objection, any of you, let's, let's bring it on. Let's like bring it for uh, the question. Let's bring it to the floor. Ed. So let's. Excuse me, po point of order. I think uh, Trustee Malauulu tried to make a friendly amendment or substitute motion 
and you didn't ask if it was if there was well a we second. have a motion Excuse and a second uh, that we haven't taken a vote on mr otto to make or ask for a substitute motion you didn't ask it if it had a second well we're first going to vote for the first um the motion second that is before us order. no Point of order. i made an amendment yeah, Mr. Lipton, um, what would you advise? Uh, from there's there is a motion on the table from a procedural point of view. Uh, Trustee Malaulu uh, made a uh, requested a, mo a friendly amendment to the motion, uh, and that would require consent by the person that trustee that made the motion as well as the second to accept that. Uh, alternatively, uh, Trustee Malaulu or any other trustee could make a motion to table and that would uh, take precedence and there could be a vote on that if there was a motion and a second to table. But, but I think the first step is to see if there's, uh, if the uh, Trustee Baxter and Trustee Entuk will accept the friendly amendment and then that will replace the motion that's currently on the table. The amendment to postpone. Trustee Baxter, Trustee Entuk, do you accept that? Uh, I do. Trustee Entuk? Uh, she does, I do. Okay, so we're going to vote on uh, So now, uh, uh, Trustee Sia, there, there's a new motion on the table that's been made and seconded, and there can be further discussion at, that, at this point. And at the end of the discussion, sure. there should be a vote on this new motion. Could okay. somebody could we repeat the motion? I'm not sure that it got fully articulated. Yeah, Vice President Malolu, your motion, um, your substitute motion. I, I didn't make a substitute motion. No, I did. Right. I, I would just like to move that we postpone voting on this proposed amendment until staff has an opportunity to integrate the corrections and address the concerns that we have voiced today, whenever that is, whenever staff brings it back to us. Is there a second? Is, is there a second? Uh, tr Trustee Zia, I, I think the next step with due respect is to see, <coughs> as stated, if uh, Trustee Baxter accepts that as a substitute motion and Trustee Entuk as the seconder accepts that as the substitute motion. Okay, I accept. Yeah. Okay. So now there's a new motion on the table for further discussion. Right, to postpone this item until we get all the questions that the trustees have. And, you know, this is the time to discuss it. You know, so please bring your questions so the staff yeah, actually I, knows what to work on. I uh, I'd like to make the suggestion that it be no later than August of yeah, this year. I agree with you, uh, Trustee Otto, that there should be a timeline on this so it doesn't go on uh, interminably. Yeah. Is that possible? Mr. Lipton? I, I had a question for Mr. Lipton. Uh, excuse me a second. Did you want to speak to that? I, uh, I, I was you. just, I think it should be clarified if that request for a timeline is formally part of the motion. And uh, that would be up to uh, sure. Trustee Malaulu, and, and, and then again to yeah. Trustee Baxter and Trustee Entuk <coughs> to accept that, and then that time frame becomes part of the motion. I think that's reasonable. Two months is good. Yeah, I don't, I don't want this to linger. I want it to get done. Well, if you didn't want it to linger, you would vote on it tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> All right, is there any, um, oh, let's call for the vote. I have a question. Yes, Matt, uh, um, Superintendent. I think that the corrected version was given out tonight and I haven't heard any additional corrections. I'm going to need a consensus of the board to tell me exactly what corrections you would yeah, like to well, see in there so that I make sure I reflect that. Yes, board members, what question, corrections do you, would you like to well, see? I, uh, I'll take the floor. I wanna see a district-wide PLA, so I'd like to see a threshold so that the future projects are all covered. Uh, and I know that was something we talked about in the facility committee and it never came back to the board. It was a $5 million threshold, a $2 million threshold. Like, we, I know there's like $700 million worth of work still there. And we're talking about $300 million. 
So what what is the threshold? Mr. Miller, trying? if uh, I think um, if you want to speak to that, I, I don't believe, uh, or maybe our staff can speak. We don't have thresholds. It's all our projects, correct? There's different ways to do it. The projects were, were identified, followed the pattern from the first agreement that looked at the schedule for the bond-funded programs for that would begin within the next 10 years and identified all of those. So rather than having a threshold, we identified the bond-funded programs that were on the list, um, preserving the right to reorder them as um, the board at the board's discretion. Yeah, and, and just just to be to make sure I understand, there was a um, another allegation that was made that this is going to be for fiduciary responsibility. Is the is there a fiscal impact? Are we going to be paying extra um, to have this PLA extended? It's or any other any kind of fiduciary or fiscal issues and financial issues that we will have to bear as an uh, excess? Um, the specific expense that comes out of a PLA is um, for the monitoring for the Solis group. Um, otherwise, um, it's difficult to say what the impact is because we only build a project once and they're unique. What I can say is that all but one of the projects we've completed thus far have come in under, um, within our budget, when you adjust for escalation fees and expansions of scope, the exception will be the um, auditorium, and that's because it is a unique project and that the lowest bidder did come in higher than we had expected. So I can say that with the current projects that have been completed under the current PLA, they've come in within budget when you uh, um, adjust for expansion of scope and escalation. Okay, well we certainly can't put um, a measure and price on wage theft and issues that we deal with on non-PLA projects and the, I can tell you uh, for certain projects I've worked on the, the incredible rate of investment, return on our investment as project labor agreements has been tremendous because we don't have wage theft issues, we don't have a litany of change orders that we have to deal with. With that, uh, let's call uh, the vote. Can, Madam Secretary. Can I read the motion? Sure. So we're clear. Um, Trustee Malaulu made a friendly amendment to postponing, uh, postpone voting on this amendment until further questions are answered, but not postponed any later than August. Trustee Intook and Trustee Baxter agreed. Let's go ahead. Okay. Call, call for the Virginia room. Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Nay. You know who your true friends are, folks. We will now move on to the next item. <laughs> item 2.8. 2.9 ASP President's Report is uh, Paolo, John Paolo here. I think you had to go back. Um, student Trustee Report. We don't have a Student Trustee Report. LBCCA FA Bargaining President Report. Kristen Moreno, are you here? Hello again. Um, this evening will be my last report to you as FA president. As you know, I served as interim FA president and I will be returning to my role as FA VP in the fall. I'm excited about beginning my sabbatical project for the college next year and I want to thank this board for continuing to support faculty professional development in the, in the way of sabbaticals. Thank you very much for that. I've worked with most of you very closely for the last two years and I've appreciated all of the opportunities for collaboration for faculty and for students and I will miss working with, with you. Faculty will continue to deliver student success but before I wrap up there are a couple quick items. 
One FA would like to thank our outgoing um, board president, Sunny Zia, for her support um, of students and faculty. You've been a real advocate and we want to extend a thank you to you for that. Um, we look forward to continuing these conversations with the new um, board president and trustees. And now I'd like to hand it off to our incoming FA president, Diana Ogamachi. I will keep this short as I'm sure everybody would not want to be here on Thursday. Would that be correct? <laughs> um, so first, um, I have had the pleasure of working with some of you in the past, and I am looking forward to working with all of you in the future. Um, I would t like to take this opportunity to publicly thank Kirsten Moreno uh, for stepping in as president when Janae Hun went on her sabbatical. So thank you, Kirsten. Um, oh. um, I'd like to use the metaphor of a sturdy chair. I believe that in order to have a sturdy chair, you need um, a strong seat, which is the student, and four strong legs to support that uh, seat. The four legs, I believe, are the board of trustees, the administrators, the faculty, as well as the classified staff. We need all of these to support that seat, which is the student, for the sturdy chair, which is Long Beach City College. So I look forward being one of those legs, a part of one of those legs to support the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, item 2.12, um, AFT bargaining president's report. Hi, Susan. Thank you for your patience, all of you. Good evening, board president Zia. Superintendent Romali, trustees, vice presidents, colleagues, and community. Tonight will be my last board meeting as the classified union president. I just want to say it's been an honor and a privilege to work with you. Thank you for the support that you've given me in this role. I've been on the classified uh, executive board for seven years, and I guess it's time for me to move on. I do want to sit here this evening listening to the conversation about the construction and the homeless students and how we take care of them. I understand it's very important to take care of the homeless students, but I just want you to remember that we're already understaffed in the custodians and in the maintenance, and then that cost needs to be examined and looked at. It's a great idea to take care of the students, but what's going to happen to the, to the college facilities? That's my concern, and maybe because I work in facilities, and I clean up after everybody. And I know that our custodians talk to me about there's not enough staffing. So I want you to consider that as well. And then managing the parking lot. And if they're going to sleep in the cars, I mean, I, I get it on the humanitarian sense. I totally do. But I'm also looking at the other side of the classified staff that I represented that would have to take care of this. And so um, I just ask that you look at that. How are we going to manage the, you know, trash issue, the cl cleaning of the facilities, and... Um, all the other things that will go on. And I just see that as a, an expense, and I think it needs to be, you know, considered. I think it's a great idea. I understand. I could tell you my story someday. I'm not going to say it here, but I've been in that dire moment of life. And this college, in Long Beach City College, helped me bridge that gap. And I was able to get my life back in order and support my family due to this institution. And I just want to thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Susan. It's been a pleasure having you as the uh, Chai 
um, the, uh, as the AFT bargaining president. Um, so we will now move on to item 2.13, Chai bargaining president report. Um, don't see anyone um, from Chai. Um, item 5.1, facilities master plan update. 4.1. Oh, sorry. We already heard 4.1. <laughs> Um, this is an informational item that um, Vice President of our Business Services will introduce. Um, Marlene. Thank you. Tonight I'd like to introduce you to Walter Johnson. He is our new Senior Director of Facilities. You've met him once before on the evening at which um, his appointment to the position was ratified. This will be uh, Mr. Johnson's first opportunity to address you in his official capacity. And um, I will acknowledge at first that he has been on the job for how many weeks, Walter? A month. A month. So this is his one month anniversary. Um, so we have for you both a presentation on our current and upcoming construction projects as well as an additional report that provides for you our projects, what the original budget was, what it currently is, what the um, master plan reflects as the start dates, and what we now know with changes in our schedule, what those start dates are more likely to be. But with that, I'll let Mr. Johnson take it away. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Board President, Trustees. And I will proceed with the construction update. Uh, Okay, what I was, I will start uh, with the agenda, and the agenda reads uh, scheduled maintenance project, district wide energy project, campus improvement project, current construction project, current design projects, and completed construction projects. And the way I would like to proceed, I will, I will highlight some of the uh, projects on the list without reading the entire list. And I would like to start with the district-wide energy project. Okay, on the district-wide energy project, these are projects under Prop 39, and they are, the first project is LED light and retrofit, which encompasses building T, AHH, and O2. Uh, this project is complete, and the second project is the uh, LAC parking lot, that's E parking lot D, E, F, G, H, I, and M. And that is another light retrofit uh, in PC parking lot six. And installation is scheduled for summer of 2018. Our district wide energy project, the IEMP will be integrated with the 2041 facility master plan and design standard to reach our goal of district wide net zero by 2050. And that would also include the EV charging stations, which is coming to the board at a future meeting. Our next project is Building J. Uh, this project is home to the Performing Arts Department. It would include state-of-the-art audiovisual and a new HVAC system. Uh, the project has some delays because of the weather, because of the rain, and the estimated completion is spring 2020. The next project is the LAC Kinesiology Labs and Aquatic Center. Uh, this project is a, a very complex project. 
This is a state-of-the-art athletic facility and is entirely funded by bond funds. Our next project is LAC Building M. It's a multidisciplinary classroom. And this project is a great example of the design build delivery method. It utilizes a collaborative effort between LBCC, the bond management team, the design team, and the contract to plan, to construct, and deliver a quality product that is cost-effective, sustainable, and completed on a much faster time. The next project is the LAC Building X Central Plan Expansion. Uh, this project allows the uh, college to meet the need with our growing footprint. It allows us to meet the need of our heating and cooling uh, for future needs. Our next project is the PCC Building MM Construction Phase 1. This project allows LBCC to support the expansion of our trade program. Our next project is our Pacific Coast Campus parking structure. This project will be used to announce the college uh, on, the, on the Pacific Coast Highway to do graphics on the building. Uh, you got bold graphics that when you drive up PCC, you'll be able to see and, and know that you're driving up to the Long Beach uh, City College Pacific Coast Campus. The Art Deco design helps beautify the neighborhood. It provides electronic vehicle charging on the first floor. You'll have 14 uh, stations to serve, uh, 14 stations to, to, to serve 27 EV parking stalls. The project, with the parking structure will be fully secured. Uh, the first floor will be, have design elements that will protect the uh, building from anyone that's trying to enter the facility that shouldn't be. It will provide adequate parking to accommodate students, faculty, and staff. Thank you. As you can see, uh, Mr. Johnson did a great job of highlighting those upcoming projects um, and skipping over some of those projects that I think that the board and the public are very aware of, including DMP, which recently had ribbon cuttings, but we are both available to answer your questions. <coughs> board members, is there any questions on the presentation on the item? I do. <coughs> Trustee Anta. Great, thank you, Walter. Welcome, We're happy to have you. Uh, thank welcome you. to Long Beach. I know you had to relocate from the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, Berkeley? From Berkeley. I, I hear go bears in my house all the time because my wife went to Berkeley, so <laughs> I know how good it is to get away from all that. Uh, <laughs> um, a couple questions, and I don't know if you know the answer, Marlene or someone else knows the answer. Um, on the aquatic center that's going in here along Carson, which direction of that picture of the courtyard, what direction is that gonna be facing? Out towards the street or in towards the campus? I haven't seen an aerial orientation of the building, and I know it's, it's, that's the next big one here uh, at LAC. If you don't mind, Walter, I'll take that one, and I don't know if it's possible to bring up um, slide 10 back up on while I'm talking, um, just so that everybody in the audience can get the same reference. So when we're looking at slide 10 and the rendering of that, we're actually looking at the building standing on faculty. So we are looking at the east side of that complex. To the right of that picture would be Carson. And then um, to the south would be Lou Davis. 
So this will be where the tennis courts are right now? It's, we, if um, yeah, where the rendering of those pedestrians are standing, they're actually standing in a walkway. We turn um, Faculty Avenue into a pedestrian walkway courtyard area. That dri those park that that drive area will be gone. Correct. The be Correct. Gone. The parking that's there will be relocated to another similar um, close area. And then I guess the question: um, Why we're doing the construction in this area? Does it impact the soccer fields in the? Tennis courts are going to go somewhere else, or is that part of this project? Great question. It's a question that we recently received from um, Vice President Malauulu. Yes, it will. So part of all of our construction plans includes planning for what we call swing space. How do we accommodate the programs and classes that are going to be um, dislodged by the construction. And for this project, it's particularly challenging because we have to find unique facilities. And so all of these programs, and working very closely with, um, with the athletics program and Bill Husak, we've been able to identify both on-site and off-site um, locations. So much like when we're working with the auditorium and we've used neighboring school districts or city auditoriums to hold our events, it's the same thing here. We have a combination of other city and other school facilities that we have lined up for the course of the next two years to accommodate these programs. Soccer specifically, some will be, um, we've been able to squeeze it all in the schedule at Veterans Stadium, so some will be held there, some will be held off site. And then the new permanent tennis courts are going to go where? Are they? They're the, not part of this project, but they're going to. This is going to over top. The the new tennis courts are part of this project, and they will be located, <coughs> um, if memory serves, just to the west, I believe, of what you're looking at here. Great. Other question on the PCC uh, structure. What intersection is it going to be on? Is it where the mobile, the, the bungalows are right now, or is it going to be on the main one where um, Alameda and PCH or is it on the backside by Chittick Field? This is on the um, west side of the campus. So this is where the current parking lot is, and we have a couple of the portable buildings in there that formerly housed the Kinship Foster Program. So as you're driving down PCH, um, going east, that's actually the first rendering. If we could go to slide 14, um, that um, rendering shows us driving westward on PCH, the uh, rendering on the left side. The, the Trustee Baxter, I think um, Trustee Intuck still has the floor. I had the same question that she was asking. So wh what street is that? Um, and, and help me, um, guys, I can't remember which street that is. That's the far Walnut. 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 Thank you, So this Walnut. is adjacent to Chittick Field. Okay. Correct. Okay. Just for Chittick. Correct. Right. Okay. Just trying to understand where we're in proximity. And then for this, I know there's solar panels are going on the roof. How much, uh, what's the megawatts of what's, what's going into this project? I'm going to ask um, Terrence because I can tell Terrence knows the answer to your question. I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm sure he does. So Terrence DeGray with Cordova. Yeah, um, about uh, 300 uh, kilowatts, sorry, megawatts. Megawatts, like kilowatts. Or kil <laughs> 300 megawatts. And that, and that energy will go towards on campus grid or is it going to get sold back to Southern California Edison or? for the EV chargers? Um, it's just gonna go back into this facility and then we have an interconnection uh, application that we had to work with Southern California Edison. So we'll go, any excess power would go back into the grid because uh, we don't have the battery storage capacity that, that to hold that right now. So it offsets our electricity bills and actually similar to the LAC parking structure, which contributes about 11 to 13% of our electricity bills offsets the General fund cost for the electricity bill. What's that in dollars? And that percentage is that offset? I, I would have to get back to you. I don't know that. I will come back to you with that answer. Okay. And then the last thing on a general facilities question um, I have a number of students complain to me about our parking meters on campus being old and uh, outdated and only taking coins. And I know the city has solar powered credit card taking um, uh, parking meters. And I'm 
particularly here on I know, this faculty way back here, uh, going to the between us and the vet stadium. Do we own those, or is that city owned? That we would have to get the city to change those out, or the those those along um, the Lou Davis or city. Yeah, owned. Lou Davis. And then the, I guess the ones over by the food court or in student union, those are ours. Yep. Who do you guys oversee that? Or is that somebody else? We work with uh, the, the parking department. So the, like whenever we do a new project and those are installed, uh, the contractor puts the infrastructure in, and then we buy that parking permit meter. They do take credit cards. So we have to, credit to card tickets. ones now? Yes, sir. Are they solar powered? Yes, sir. When did they go in? Um, we have one near our building in 01. That, that's been there for probably like, since I've been here, five years. But by the by the by the student union across the street, those meters? I don't know those ones as well, but I can check it out. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to, to find out who, if what, what what's the inventory we have on campus that are ours versus the city's. And then if we if we already had solar and everything's take credit cards, great. Maybe the students are just complaining about the city ones on the street here. I don't know. It might be just the city ones. I know the ones within our parking lot. Um, we the district owns those, and then the ones along the city street. And the Lou Davis is the city uh, street. So so we you know there are some of our utilities that run underneath that street, um, and we have to work with the city actually on a project we're doing this summer for the city. So that those are the only ones I'm aware of that are city. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Baxter. No, I was just asking. <laughs> I was just asking if the parking structure was on May, but you clarified it's on Walnut. Sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted. Oh, that's okay. Happens all the time. Um, not on your account. Um, if there are no other questions and if the staff doesn't have any um, further comments, uh, this was an information item. We didn't need to vote on it. We will move on to consent agenda items. Um, is there a, uh, I didn't receive any requests to pull any items. Uh, is there a motion to approve consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Baxter, moved by Trustee Intook. Um, all in favor? I got a comment. Aye. Oh. Well, I got a comment. Trustee Intook. Uh, yeah, no, I wanted to uh, thank the staff for adding on the actual contracts now. Um, I know I had talked about it just had a CN number in the past, and now the attachments are there. I think it's really important that they're there, that we can see them, the public can see them. You know, I was going through and I was like, oh, the numbers didn't add up. This is a contract from 2017. It's like, oh, this is an amendment to the 2017 contract. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's a, a marketing improvement in transparency. It may take a little bit more time getting the scanned PDFs uploaded, but I think it's worth the effort that we can see what's there and it's not a mystery of what we're voting on. Thank you. Vice President Malolu. Yes, I would also um, like to echo thanks to that. Um, I know that I had asked for that a while back and I'm very happy to see um, not only on the attachment, but also even on the extended agenda, that there's just a little bit more information. And the reason why I like that is because if the information is sufficient on the extended agenda, I don't need to click on the attachment. And before, you know, just having the line item there, I, I always had to click on the attachment no matter what. But now, even with just that blurb, that makes a big difference. So, and oftentimes, having a download and memory it just I really appreciate that and and I apologize a little out of order I just wanted to to thank Mr. Johnson for his report I don't know if he left or not there he is I didn't have that opportunity sorry but you did a great job for your first report thank you all in favor aye all opposed moving on to item 7.1 resolution uh, reduction of classified service this is an action item that the board of trustee um, consider the reduction of classified services as submitted based on California Education Code 88127 that prescribes that classified employees shall be subject to layoff for lack of work or lack of funds. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Mo moved by Trustee Intuk, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none. Um, Excuse me. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to be real clear about what we think the likelihood is that this will come to pass or whether this is one of those things that you have to 
timely give the notice? Um, are we in a position where we think that we're going to have to lay off some classified people before long? No, actually, what this is, as we had discussed with the board, is just a reorganization in uh, support, uh, student support services, which Dr. Munoz can speak to. Um, in addition, the three people who are listed on this uh, have r uh, property rights to lower level positions, which we are offering them as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. <coughs> we will now move on to, is, was there something you wanted to? Item 7.2, indefinite salary rates for district employees. This is a recommendation that in anticipation of any potential financial uncertainties, negotiations, legislation, or other factors that the governing board declare that all salary rates be declared indefinite for fiscal year 2019-2020 for academic employees represented by LBCC FA and CHI, classified employees represented by AFT, management team employees, and other represented employees as submitted. Uh, do I have a motion? So move. Second. Move by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Antuk. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Item 7.3, revised salary schedule, classified um, classifications exempt from the merit system. This is the an action, recommended action, that the Board of Trustees approve the revised exempt salary schedule to be effective July 1st, 2019, as submitted. We have the information before us, and it's been properly noticed. Is there is a motion? So move. Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Item 7.4, employment contract with Alicia Kirkwood, Dean of Student Affairs. This is an action item that the Board of Trustees approve the employment contract for Alicia Kirkwood. Dean of Student Affairs has submitted the employment contract provides for a term of employment from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2021, an annual compensation of 142,471,000, yeah. along with health and welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Are there any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Congratulations, Alicia, and welcome aboard. 7.5, uh, employment contract with Kirsten Olson, Associate uh, Vice President of Human Resources. This is an action on the Board of Trustees approved the employment contract for Kirsten, Kristen Olson, Associate Vice President of Human Re Resources, as submitted the employment contract provides for a term of employment from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2021, and annual compensation of 184,000. 814, along with health and welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, motion made by Trustee uh, Intuk and uh, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Are there any questions, comments? Can I say one thing? Certainly. I just want to say congratulations. Um, uh, Kristen is the only employee in the district that I got to interview and hire uh, because when I was on the personnel commission when we were doing the recruitment for uh, uh, back then the, the classified before she got the intern in, in lieu. And so um, I, I remember going through the process. We were, we were, she was a phenomenal candidate and we were worried that we didn't have relocation money. Is she really going to come to Long Beach from the Bay Area? She's up north. And, um, but we, we found out she had a family connection in Long Beach. And so uh, we, you know, we, we changed our actual salary schedule to make sure that we could potentially offer her something competitive. And uh, we were really excited and happy that she accepted. And I think it's a great uh, promotional opportunity for the college to reward somebody who's done a lot of hard work. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of the domino effect of Jean moving up and Kristen moving up. And now we got to find a new classified uh, <laughs> uh, director. But I just want to say uh, congratulations and, and keep up the good work. Are there any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Congratulations, Kristen, and welcome. Item 7.6, 2019 um, 
equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity plan. This is an action item that the Board of Trustees adopt the equal uh, employment opportunity plan for 2019 2022. Um, we have the information before us. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. I believe we have a presentation. Um, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Did you yes, want we have a short presentation uh, from uh, AVP, Kristen Olson. Thank you. Good evening, board members, vice president, superintendent, and audience members. My name is Kristen Olson, and I'm currently in the role of interim associate vice president of human resources. If it pleases the board, I'd like to call the attention to the report before you, and I'll briefly walk you through the process of revising the equal opportunity um, employment plan for 2019-2022. So the purpose of the EEO plan is to serve as a guidance tool for the college and the board. It is um, meant to help guide us in terms of our employment opportunities and make sure that we have proper procedures, action plans, and, and programs in place to ensure that we're moving toward our diversity goals in employment, both for academic and classified employees. The legal authorities for this are in Title V and also the Education Code. Specifically in, within Title V, it is 53001, and in the Education Code, it's 87100, and that's contained within the plan itself, if the board members would like to reference that on page five and six. It is code, so it is dry, so <laughs> you may not want to. Basically, I'll, I'll summarize what it says, and it um, assures um, that colleges are committed to um, diversity and employment. Now, in revising the plan, we participated in the shared governance process, uh, making sure that we had multiple perspectives and groups involved in this process. Um, a subcommittee was formed uh, from the diversity committee, and individuals that were on the committee were uh, classified employees, academic employees, managers, and confidential employees. So all perspectives were involved. From there, we put the plan before the academic senate, and we also received input from the classified senate. We also put the plan before college planning committee, received all that feedback, reincorporated it into the plan, then brought it back to the diversity committee for approval, and now it's before the board for consideration. In total, this took about eight months to do and countless meetings. I can't even recall how many meetings we had. Um, so it's thoroughly vetted. Moving along, part of the revision process was making sure that we incorporated all uh, legal updates within the plan because it is revised every three years. So we wanna make sure that any new laws are incorporated into the plan. Specifically, we incorporated the updates pertaining to FIHA and gender identity and gender expression because those were new laws that were passed um, before the last plan was in place. So we made sure to put that information in there. We also made sure to remove language that was overly procedural. Since this is a document that is meant to be guidance and advisory and the board and designees will develop action plans in terms of creating uh, initiatives to achieve greater diversity in employment. We don't want to unnecessarily lock ourselves into any procedure. Here are some of the major sections of the plan so the board can see what we um, worked on and the areas that the plan speaks to. As you can see, it's the gamut of all actions uh, with regard to employment from onboarding to exit, um, training, accommodations, everything. So we make sure to touch on all of those within the plan. Currently it's maintained on the LBCC webpage and the HR um, department's webpage. The current plan is on the webpage and once the new plan is approved, then we'll exchange uh, our current plan for the newly approved plan. And that uh, concludes my report. Are there any questions, trustees? Thank you. Uh, this is great. Trustee Entuk. Uh, yeah, great uh, update. Um, I know we're going to be kicking off the President's Equity Task Force in the fall. Um, what is your thoughts or potential implementation into the next time the plan's updated of some things that could come out of that process that may be related? Um, absolutely. I think um, we would only become more informed in terms of initiatives. 
And I actually don't even know if you'd want, want to wait for uh, the um, next plan revision. This may be something that we could even partner with the diversity committee and try to develop um, initiatives that are current and ongoing so we can be as responsive as possible. And I remember, and I don't know if it, it, it's included or <clears throat> is, is unrelated, um, back in the personnel commission days, we were looking at uh, making sure that we had representation on the hiring committees and being explicit of um, you know, women and men and people of color included, uh, not just to be there, but to be part of the decision-making process. Does that, did that get formalized in this, or is that something we need to, to look at formalizing, or is that um, done already? What it, what's the status of that? That specifically is not formalized in the plan because the plan is more um, guidance and advisory. So it would speak to um, goals and the general direction that the college wants to go in. From that higher level uh, advisory place of the plan, then the board and designees, we would decide this is one way that we want to um, meet the goals of the plan and achieve diversity and ensure that we have proper representation on our hiring panels so that we're creating a welcoming environment for um, potential candidates so that they want to come on board. And, and last question, I did get a complaint about um, the EEOC rep on some of the hiring uh, committees, not necessarily going through training or was kind of a hodgepodge designation. Do we have a pool of people that are updated that have gone through the training, or do we do that on a frequent basis? And when was the last time it was updated as far as who that pool of EEOC folks are? Absolutely. We keep um, a current pool and spreadsheet of everyone that has um, participated in the training and can be accessed as an EEO rep for any of the hiring committees. Additionally, anytime we establish a committee, anyone that hasn't participated in the training does participate in the training. And the training for um, EEO uh, was something that we revised within the last year and a half, so it is new as well. And we're currently revising it further and articulating further modules, so it will be um, even more robust within this coming year. So it is something that we track, take seriously, we make sure everyone's trained properly um, in order to participate in the hiring process. Okay, thank you. Any other trustees? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? We will now move on to item 8.1. This is a new catalog language regarding general education reciprocity for students seeking local AA or AS degrees. It is an action item that the board uh, approved the new catalog language regarding general education reciprocity for students seeking local associates in art or associate in science degrees, effective fall 2019 as submitted. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Are there any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Item 8.2, Modification to General Education Plans, A, B, and C. This is an action item that the Board of Trustees approved the addition of courses to general education plans A, B, and C, and the modification of mathematics proficiency language on plan A as submitted. Is there a motion? So, so moved. Move. Second. Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Otto. Uh, are question. there any questions? Yes, Trustee Antuck. What, what's the impact of this modification? This is for new students coming in. They're going to have a new AA program, or these are new AA programs are now aligned with A, B, and C schedule. Can anybody say what's the what's the impact of students with this change? You know, I may have. I'm sorry. I may have Michelle Grimes someone come up and answer this question. Are you asking specifically about math? So, uh, we, uh, I, don't, I don't understand your specific question. Sorry, we're modifying the A, B, and C plans, correct? This is 8.2? We're going to write one? Correct. Correct. Right? And we're, we're yeah, modifying what it takes to get an AA degree. When a student, uh, to me, the most important page of the catalog and handbook is when students look at A, B, and C and they say, okay, I'm going to go CSU track, I'm going to go IGETC, or I'm just going to go associate AA. What is this doing to change that? Okay, and Trustee Antic, I'm sorry, um, and I can certainly have Michelle answer this too, but it has to do with math proficiency and allowing classes that students take in the high school to count for proficiency here. 
And so it's the overall philosophy is to try to remove roadblocks for students. And Michelle, if I'm missing anything. Nope. Is part of AB 709 with the remedial education reform too? Correct, that's slightly different, but it's connected to all of this, yes. We're trying, yeah, we're trying not to allow these types of courses to be roadblocks. And if students have taken the appropriate course in high school, then we're going to count that. How, and then how does this impact with dual enrollment? So if someone takes it in high school, it's gonna count uh, for dual enrollment for a prerequisite to take the transferable math and English? Well, we're really not offering math as a dual enrollment course. Um, pretty much that's handled by the high schools. Um, and Mike, I don't know if you want to add to that. A student could be in high school and be concurrently enrolled and enroll in a math class on campus, but as part of our ECCP program, our dual enrollment model, we aren't offering math courses at the high school. That's correct. But I, I guess my last question, they, these math changes will make it easier for students to get to the transferable math? Yes, it's for both math and English, AB 705. So we've removed several of the levels that are far below transfer level. Students are going into higher level classes with a co-rec in some cases to provide extra support for students who would have tested in lower, who are coming in with a lower GPA. And this is effective for this fall? Correct, okay. although we've already started. We started well ahead of time and um, Yes, we started well ahead of time, as is what we do, and um, but it's true. It, yes, it's a, the legislation is effective in fall. Thank you. Are there any? Sorry. <laughs> Are there any other um, trustees, Vice President Malauulu? Just one quick question: the students who are enrolling in both classes with the co-rec is that still three-unit class? The co-rec is a separate course that's added on, so it's not like the original course has been added. You know, you still have the primary course and you have the co-rec, which may be one or two units depending on what it is, whether Additional. it's math or English, yes. Um, and they may, students may opt to take math and English in the same semester, or they may not. They may take math in their fall semester, English in their spring semester, or they could take them at the same time. But you're, you're right, if you're indicating that it's a lot of units that students are suddenly taking a lot of math and English, yes. I'm just concerned about um, if a student is already deficient in a subject and he's taking the regular three unit class, if he has to take the additional class to become proficient in the subject, isn't that kind of like a lab, an additional, um, not lab per se vocabulary, but a lab per se with additional units? Yes. But if you look at it differently, and these are usually not three unit classes, they're four or five unit classes in the case of math. Um, but you're looking at you know, a student who could have come in here previously and taken three math classes, which is 15 units of math. Now they're coming in and taking a five unit class and perhaps a two unit co-rec. So it's a lot fewer units in the longer run. It may be more units in that one semester, but in the longer run, it, they're going to get out faster. That's the intention, and, and to not bog students down who aren't ever going to get through that sequence. Sure, and, and I, I appreciate the uh, thought behind combining the two. That's great. Now, as far as when you said that some of the high school students might be able to meet that requirement, are they through, are they A through G requirements? Is that part of it, or would that have no bearing on it? Because students who are generally on that college track and do the A through G requirements won't enter a community college deficient. But right. if they're taking some of those classes that are part of that A through G requirement, would that allow them to skip these classes here? Yes. Or get credit for them? For the, from, yeah, they would already meet the math proficiency. They wouldn't have to take another math class here. But it also depends on their GPA coming in and their GPA in math and, and those kinds of factors. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? More question. On, so on Trustee the, Antuk. On the uh, math, so if I'm a new student coming in, we're, do, we're changing it where you, you have multiple measures of seeing if you're proficient. So you, you don't necessarily have to take a test, but you can come and say, I took these classes at, at Jordan, and now I want to be into the transferable math or college algebra or whatever is the, mm -hmm. the number. Um, is the only way to get there is by showing you past these classes? Is, it, is there still students going to take a test to for placement? Is it only going to be, or they, I, I know we've talked about SAT as a measure and classes as a measure. 
Uh, how is no, the new coming into they, the they can show their transcripts, and if they don't have transcripts for whatever reason, they complete an, a, a form where they're asked questions about their, um, their high school experience, their, the classes they took, the proficiency they feel they have in math and English. There's a series of questions that we've developed, and based on those questions, it's, it's a self-guided, th then they would be placed. We're not doing the assessment the way that we have, and the, and the state isn't even supporting those assessment tests any longer. And then are, is, are the, the, the new structured, are those going to be only offered in fall? They're going to start being offered in summer of 2020? Um, do we, are we only do fall and spring with them? Cause the yeah, there is some concern on the faculty members' parts about having these, these math classes with the co-rec in the summer because it's so short. Well, actually, that's not necessarily true. In the, in the longer six and eight week, it could be done, but in the five week, there's concern about that. Um, so they would be in the longer stretches. Um, Michelle, I don't know, what, in terms of what we're offering for, for summer, I don't know that these are going online in summer. I think they start in fall, yeah. I think it's both the English and math department had concerns about offering these in five week blocks. So we have the six and eight week blocks for both math and science classes. Give students a little bit longer time to get through. And the first time that'll be available is next summer. No, the, the courses are available this fall. Oh, just right. for this yeah, fall. Yeah, we're starting in fall, but in the potentially next summer we could offer them in the six or the eight week format. Yeah. I don't know that the faculty are going to be supportive of, a, of say, a five unit math class and a two unit co rec in a five unit, a five week session, which is also what we have in winter. I can totally see that. It's too much and too little time. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the clarification. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Item 8.2, modification to general education plan A, B, and C. This is a recommended action. The Board of Trustees approve the addition of courses to general ed plan A, B, and C, and the modifications of mathematics proficiency language on plan A as submitted. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Item 8.3, new, modified, and inactive courses. Didn't we just do that? Yeah. One. Mr. Otto, we just finished item 8.2. We're now under 8.3, under new, modified, and inactivated courses. This is a recommended action that the Board of Trustees approve the new modified and inactivated order. I want to be clear about that because I thought we just had moved on 8.3. No, we didn't. We moved on 8.2. Anybody else think we did? I did. Pardon? I, I thought yeah, we just, we we just voted on, on 8.3. Oh, 8.3. 8.3, it's right there. Yeah. That's the more than just No, it's uh, 8.3 is what. Read 8.2. We voted on 8.2. I just called, um, and then 8.3 has. We haven't taken the vote yet. Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't called for it yet. I was reading the item before I was uh, a point of order was called. This is an action on the board of trustee approve the new modified and activated courses effective fall 2020 as submitted. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Trustee um, moved by Vice President Malaudu and seconded by Trustee Antuk. Are there any questions, comments? Uh, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, now we will move on to item 8.4. This is a new modified and activated programs of study. It is an action item that the Board of Trustees approve the new modified and inactivated programs of study. Effective fall 2020 as submitted. Is there a motion? So Second. Moved by Vice President Malaulu, seconded by Trustee Entuk. Are there any questions, comments? Comment. Trustee Entuk. I just want to say thank you for itemizing the 
each of the programs, just like in the previous one with the courses, it makes it much easier to follow and then also to search for in, in the future going back. So thank you and, and recognize the, the change, so thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. We will now move on to item 9.1, uh, revised academic calendar. Uh, this is a, an action item that the Board of Trustees approved the revised 2019-2020 <coughs> academic calendar as submitted. Um, this was approved by the Board in 2017, September of 2017. Uh, college day was scheduled for April, t uh, for August 21st, 2020, but it should have been scheduled on August 28th which is the last Friday before the first day of the fall term of 2020. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Motion made by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion passes item 9.2, academic calendars 2021, 2020 to 2021, and 2021 to 2022. This is an action item that the Board of Trustees approved the 2020, 2021, and 2021, 2022 like academic calendars are submitted. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Uh, are there any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, move on, moving on to item 9.3, revised board policy and administrative regulation for open courses, prerequisites, core, um, Quizits and advisories. Uh, this is a first rating and it's an informational item. We have it uh, before us. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, um, we, we will move on to item 10.1, our tentative budget for 2019-2020. This is a um, action item that the Board of Trustees approved the tentative budget for 2019-2020 as submitted. This action is in accordance with the California Code of Regulation 58305 and a directive from the Chancellor's Office. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Moved by Vice President Malaulu, seconded by Trustee Antuk. Are there any uh, questions before we proceed with the presentation? Which one? Uh, well, let's just present the uh, Vice President Mar uh, Drink one. I believe you had a presentation. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. This is a presentation of the tentative 2019-20 budget. This will be the first time you hear this tentative budget. We will be bringing back to you the final um, budget, budget for your approval in September. This budget is largely based on the January proposal of the State Budget Act. There are a few areas where we've been able to take into consideration the May revision, but due to timing issues when we start preparation on this budget, I do want to let you know that it is based largely on the January budget. I also want to um, give you a heads up that this year in particular, the changes between the May revision and the final version of the state budget are significant. And as we go through this presentation, I will mention what you can expect to see at the final budget. So beginning with the student-centered funding formula, we know that as of the May revise, the COLA is 3.26%. For Long Beach City College, this represents an increase in revenue from the state-centered funding, or excuse me, student-centered funding formula of about $4 million. We expect to see a number of changes in the student-centered funding formula for 1920. However, because we are funded at the hold harmless level. We don't expect any of these changes to immediately impact our revenue. They will, however, have a significant impact on our revenue when we exit hold harmless. The good news is part of the proposals that are contained in the state budget, which is pending governor's signature, is an extension of that hold harmless for an additional year. So we will have four years. The intent of that is so that we have an additional year to react to the significant changes we expect. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. 
So um, it, it's really about the uh, student-centered funding formula in general. I know that they're doing this. Um, Trustee Otto, I'm sorry. Please uh, speak through the chair. And, and I would just ask that if you could be so kind to just reserve your questions till the end of the presentation. It may get answered. Um, just so out of respect to everybody's time, and it is already quarter to nine, so we have a better control over the management of these presentations. Would that be okay with you? I, I really prefer to ask my questions when they're relevant to what's being talked about then, because it, it then, you know, it, it, it would just I, be I would just appreciate if you could just note it, so that, and then we can come back to it. I, I, maybe I could get a consensus from the board. I, I don't expect to ask a lot of questions, but I'd like to be able to ask him when I can get the answers in the context of what it is that's going on. Is there a consensus from the board? It do, sorry. Yes, go ahead, it, it doesn't really bother me if you were to ask questions now versus later, but I do think it will prolong the presentation if we interrupt with questions, and typically we have waited until all presentations have been done. Personally, again, it doesn't bother me, but, you know, Past practice has always been after the presentation concludes that we go back to it. So for whatever it's worth, I don't know if anybody else has another opinion. Like I said, I don't have a lot, but I'm... Yeah, let's wait until the end, Trustee Otto. Um, go ahead, uh, Vice President, and drink one. The May revision and the January budget both would have maintained the current split between base grant, supplemental grant, and student success grant at 70-20-10, and then a future phase into the 60-20-20. You should know that as part of the state budget, it is proposed to remain at 70-20-10. The intent of that is to limit the growth or the impact of the student success grant. This is important because in 2018-19, the statewide appropriation for community colleges was not sufficient to fund the actual amounts districts would have been paid for the student-centered funding formula. And so while the chancellor's office was able to find solutions for potential 5% deficit on our revenue, one of those solutions is to preserve um, districts at the old harmless level, at the hold harmless and not suffer any deficit, but they also found other funds. But they recognized this was a problem. They needed to limit the growth in districts funding from the student center funding formula. And they're doing this primarily on the success grant. And again, the, the success grant is where they pay community colleges for the awards we provide our students. Different dollar amounts associated with associate's degrees with transfers down to certificates. So what they proposed to do at the May Revise was limit the growth in the student center grants to 10% annually on the dollar amount. They proposed to fund only the single greatest award per student. So if a student earned both an associate's degree as well as certificate, they would fund only the associate's degree. And again, this is funding to the district, not to the student. They also had a proposal to award transfer credit only to the district of residence. Of all the proposals, this was the most controversial because it could result in a district getting funding for a student for whom they did not educate. What we know now, and this has gone through a lot of different iterations, and you will see this in future years, but to give you a heads up today, is that the 10% cap on the total grant increase will remain. Only the single greatest award will remain. However, the transfer credit, as we understand it, will go to the district who who provided the greatest amount of units. That is unfortunately not what was advocated for. It, the advocation was if you provided at least 12 units in that central course of study, you would get credit. That did not succeed. And then most interestingly, it will be done on a three-year average of awards. So that's another reason we have an additional year of hold harmless, so we can actually see how this impacts us and re, uh, we can respond to it. 
at a future date, I would like to bring back the student-centered funding formula specifically to this board with an examination once we have had both the Budget Act and the trailer bill passed because it is complicated and it does have a greater um, impact on our future solvency. Moving on to other categorical programs, what's significant here is that although the January proposed budget said zero dollars for deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. Um, as of the May revise, there was $40 million, which would provide us with about $600,000. Um, the final budget had a small re reduction to that amount, but our exact allocation won't be known until the state does some calculations. We are receiving COLA in most categorical programs, and as you're aware, the California College Promise has had an augmentation. For the state-funded facilities programs, this is from the state bond fund, so not the state general fund, and we do have applications in the queue for funding. We were very concerned because at both January and the May revise, one of the projects we expected to be funded was excluded from the list. So we had both the construction trades phase one, building MM, as well as the music theater complex, building GH. Those had been applied for, we thought they were in the queue, GH was excluded. We now understand that in the budget that went to the governor for signature, it is back. So once that is signed, as you know, he has line item veto authority, so we are anxiously awaiting his signature. But once that is signed, then that will result in having those projects move forward more quickly because we have a time limitation on spending those dollars. On slide 10, we talk about the Student Equity and Achievement Program continuing at the same funding level. And a note about strong workforce, there was some confusion that it was going to be cut. It wasn't actually a cut. The state was going to substitute ongoing dollars with one-time dollars. It was concerning because that meant in future years its funding level was uncertain. We now understand that most of those one-time dollars have been replaced with ongoing dollars providing us with more certainty about future funding of the Strong Workforce Program program. The next few slides talk about the alignment with the components of the budget with both the Board of Trustee goals, with the strategic plan, and with the department and college plans that had just been developed. We have a matrix that shows what those primary initiatives are and the areas with which those initiatives align is very important to us that our budget uh, not drive policy, but rather reflect policy. This matrix goes on for several pages. We did update it this year to provide you with far more detail. I will um, share with you that for the tentative budget, not all initiatives are reflected. If those initiatives were decided on after April, a good example is the Office of Basic Needs. It will not be reflected in here, and that's one of those things you'd look for at the final budget to see its inclusion. I'll skip over this matrix unless um, you'll have questions at the end, and then I can come back to it. I'm not quite finished. Did you, did you say wait till the end or you said right now? She's not finished with her presentation, folks. Let's go ahead, Vice President Drinkwine. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. And I said I would revisit the matrix um, if you did have questions. On slide 20, we talk about um, the specific budget assumptions that we used in for our projections um, specific to our district rather than at a statewide level. The first thing I'd like to mention is this total resident FTE as target. I will say that this is the preliminary target that I know that Dr. Scott, with the assistance of a great many of her committees, have revisited this target. And when we come back in September, I'll share with you their final target that takes into consideration the summer numbers as well as the work that they've done. We always include a half percent deficit potential for our revenue. Um, 
As I mentioned, in the current year, there was the potential for a 5% deficit. So this is minimal compared to the risk, but it is necessary to have some level of uh, preparation. Our goal in the long term is to maintain our reserves at 15%, at minimum 5.5%. We show here the benefit cost changes, and I'm sure you're aware of the great many changes that have happened with the STRS and PERS over the course of the State Budget Act. And without getting into it in too much detail, I will tell you that as recently as June 28th, CalPERS was changing their projected rates for 1920. So when I come back to you in, in, in September, I will have much more specificity and finality with these numbers. But the news is better than it would have been a year ago in that the governor has proposed temporary relief from some of those increases. Not entire relief, but partial relief. This slide shows the entirety of all of our funds. For most of this presentation, I'll be discussing specifically just the unrestricted general fund. And you can see for 1920, we estimate $142 million in expenditures. But equally as important is the restricted general fund with almost $45 million. This program, or this fund rather, includes all of those restricted programs and grants that have very specific expenditures. The last item I want to point out to you are the bond funds. We have a separate fund for Measure E from and Measure LB. We budget the entirety of the remaining bond program in every year. The expenditures will always be far less because we only can spend what we issue. So then looking specifically at our unrestricted general fund, in 1819, if you recall, we had projected nearly $7 million in deficit spending. I'm very happy to share with you as a result of the implementation of the deficit reduction plan, which involved the entire district and under the leadership of Dr. Ramali and your guidance, we have managed to end the year with a projected surplus of $236,000. So very well done, everyone. Unfortunately, many of those were one-time savings. And as we discussed, DERS and PERS increases equal an ongoing increase in expenditures. And so we are currently projecting for 2019-20 a deficit of 2.9 million. I will share with you about 1 million of that is from one-time funds, so that's purposeful deficit spending. So that means our operational deficit is about 1.9 million. This slide is interesting because it does show our FTES over the course of the years. And in order to have an apples to apples comparison, if you focus on the red bar, that is our FTES without the summer shift. And that shows you the true course of our enrollment over the past several years. This is important to see the pattern because once we are funded under the student-centered funding formula, we are funded at a three-year average of our FTES. And this line graph shows the improvement of our deficit in 2018-19, again from that negative $6.7 million to a positive $200,000 and change. When we look at our revenues for 1920, we can see that we do expect an increase of $4 million for the COLA. And that's important um, because that $4 million has to absorb the increases in our salaries that are naturally occurring, step, such as step and column and um, already bargained increases. The primary source of our revenue is the state principal apportionment. And that's important to know because unlike private industry, we cannot control our revenues as much as we can control our costs. And then when we look at that expenditure summary, you'll see that the three primary areas of increase are in salaries and benefits. This is because with academic salaries, in 1819, we were able to backfill those positions that took the retirement incentive with adjunct because of the timing. To meet the fawn, we must hire them back. And that's the example of the one-time savings we achieved in 1819 to reduce that deficit. 
We also have step and column negotiated salary increases that contribute to the $2.3 million increase in academic salaries. For classified salaries, we have a $2.4 million increase due to the salary increases again from the negotiations step and column as well as some offset from reorganization. So we have continued savings from reorganization. And benefits is a combination of increases as a percentage to those increased salaries, as well as an increase in our health benefit costs from STRS, PERS, and medical benefits. For one-time funds, we are expected to spend a little bit less this year than last year, and these funds are used primarily to develop systems that help us streamline, that help us focus and that help us support reorganization. And so every dollar we spend for this purpose really results in savings in the future. And this pie chart shows you where most of our expenditures lie. We are a service industry and so most of our expenditures are in salaries and benefits which currently lie around $89.3 million. And if I can see in the future, we will continue to implement our deficit reduction plan. And much like 1819, I anticipate this dropping below that limit. And then when we look outward, this table reflects no changes in our expenditure structure. So if we did not further implement the deficit reduction plan, if we did not continue our uh, reorganization efforts, and if we did not continue to respond to the challenges, we would see a continued worsening of our ending fund balance over the course of the next three years. However, again, I anticipate continued improvement, continued focus, and continued success in reduction of that deficit. We have future budget challenges. The primary one is building our enrollment. We want to reach 20,000 by time we exit Hold Harmless. And I think you're very well aware of the initiatives from both um, Vice President Dr. Munoz and Vice President Dr. Scott in their efforts to identify programs, whether it's dual enrollment, whether it's CTE programs, adult education, or strengthening our regular four credit programs to make them attractive and to earn that enrollment. State pension obligations continue to also be a challenge, even though there is some mitigation of those costs in the current year. When we look outward, we can see that it is a constant draw on any COLA that we do receive. And again, these numbers were um, accurate for about a second, and then there was continued negotiation at the state level with the STRS and PERS. Um, we do anticipate that the STRS is 17.10 for um, STRS. However, with the recent PERS board action, we will be revisiting that at the September budget. We discussed deficit spending, and again, one million was one-time projects, so that means 1.9 million is our structural deficit. We do have plans for continued improvement. We do have plans for continued reorganization, and we believe it's necessary to invest in programs today to improve our enrollment and to improve the program. So a combination of cost savings and purposeful dedication of resources as we move forward to find solutions. Our next steps. We will come back on September 11th for a formal presentation of the final budget. Statute does require that we have a formal public hearing and announce the date and time and location of that public hearing in this presentation. The final budget will reflect the enacted state budget, which is AB 74. It is currently pending governor's signature. It will reflect enacted trailer bill AB 77, which will contain the policy changes associated with the appropriations from the Budget Act. It will reflect our final FTES budget, Importantly, 2018-19 actuals. We expect continued improvement in our ending fund balance. We don't always spend all of our blanket POs. We don't fully expend our contracts. 
And one area I can say we'll have improvement is that we set aside, like we always do, half of a percent in case the state deficits our revenue. That's about $600,000. So at very least, I think we can look at that level of improvement. It will also include the dedication of resources for any initiatives we have identified after April. So again, that would include the, uh, the creation of the Office of Basic Needs as a really great example of something that the board has approved um, but has not yet been reflected in our major budget. And with that, I am very happy to hear your questions. Trustee Otto, would you like to begin with our questions? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so um, let's start with the funding formula, and I know that it's a, still a moving target, but my sense of it is that that's the bugaboo, meaning that we don't have uh, clear answers as to what the funding formula is going to turn out to be. It was <clears throat> clear that they needed to do something about the three years of Hold Harmless, it appears that they've added a year, but I understand that there may be more discussion about even adding another year to that, depending on what happens. And that's because what happened was that there were more people in, what's the, I always forget the name of the category, <clears throat> where uh, they, they were recovering for, what, what, what's it called? Restoration. Restoration, thank you. Um, then they anticipated and um, and as a result, there were not enough funds to 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 pay for all that. But um, what what's going on at the at the state level to try and address the problems with or the the perceived problems with the funding formula? Thank you, Trustee Otto. I think you're correct that we can anticipate significant changes to the student center funding formula for the upcoming years. Um, it was interesting, I was on a conference call with Christian Osmina from the Chancellor's Office along with some regional CBOs and he was discussing the potential 5% deficit. This was back in uh, about February, April, and those potential changes. And I actually suggested that if we have those significant changes, we need to have an additional year of hold harmless just so we can understand the impact on our revenues. And obviously I was not the only one with that idea. I'm sure somebody else much higher than me suggested it to him because indeed we are getting an additional year of hold harmless. I think from my perspective that the changes we're seeing in the budget bill this year are the changes that they quickly identified as the things they could do right away to have an immediate impact. But the state committee is charged with making these changes on an ongoing basis. And that was recently convened just a couple of months ago. It has representatives from very many different stakeholder groups. And it is through that committee that they will identify and address this formula and any future changes in this formula. Um, if this process mirrors what happened at the K-12 level with their funding formula um, revisions, it will be several years before we land on what it will finally be. It'll be several years of reaction. Um, not only are we still um, creating the data that's used to drive the formula, but we're still looking at the metrics that measure success. And so our jobs, uh, meaning me and my fellow um, vice presidents, will be to continue to respond and react and be flexible and understand how it impacts our district specifically so that we can best leverage it for greater revenues while focusing primarily on still serving our students. Now, um, the... The, the 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 charts that we we kind of glossed over. Um, I mean, you said uh, w what else could that that mean? I noticed that there we we don't have a lot of checks in the area where we talk about expanding community profile to enhance enrollment and expand community outreach and recruit programs uh, and retain workforce and educate programs. I, I didn't quite understand that or why that was. I'm sure there's a simple explanation. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? 
If I can uh, rephrase your question, make sure I understand it. You're asking why we don't have more checks in columns C and E to indicate that these programs serve that purpose? Yeah. I think actually a great many of these programs do serve that purpose. Many of these programs are in themselves expanding our profile that they are reflecting community outreach. Um, this is the first time we've used this modified matrix to better reflect all of the goals related to institutional planning. And I think we were conservative in the placement of those check marks. We certainly didn't want to overreach. But this is in continued development. And I think when you see it come back to you in September, we'll have the opportunity to dig a little deeper in each of these programs and determine whether they actually do serve that purpose as well. And in, in these same columns, there's one item that is the, the business process review, things that we had. I know that was dedicated money. I, I think it when we stopped, to my knowledge, stopped doing business process review stuff, there was several million dollars in that fund. Uh, how much is, is left in that fund? I thought I saw when I looked through the budget about a million. We have about, um, we'll have about $3 million left after we get through 1920. We will be spending about a million dollars of it in 1920. We spent uh, about 700,000, $1.7 million in 1819. And a lot of those expenditures went to support changes in financial aid and to support changes in how we're doing admissions and records and working in that area to ensure that students are on the right path. Right. Looking forward for 1920, some of those expenditures will continue that effort. Other ones will look at specific business systems to help us streamline our processes, to help us automate them to do things like supporting the inclusion of the contracts on our agendas. Right now, contracts is largely a paper process, and by using systems, we can convert it to electronic, and it supports that even greater. Do, do we anticipate any major expenses in technology? We're going to have to switch systems over to do things where we st we're still PeopleSoft as our primary platform, right? Thank you. We actually are having an upgrade over the winter break this year to PeopleSoft 9.2 that will affect not the financial system, but it'll affect the other portions of PeopleSoft. PeopleSoft is our um, is our system, and any change would require a dedication of resources that we're not prepared to do at this time. Okay. And the... Um I, I see that our, we estimate our FTES total uh, resident target to be 19,204. Um, I have it in my mind that if we fell, if we were below, which we have been 20,000, that that had implications for, uh, for who we were, or what we were identified that might cost us some money. Could you explain that to me? Thank you, yes. To get a large college status, we have to maintain enrollment at $20,000. If we fall below that, we lose that status. F it's FTES, not enrollment, excuse me. If we, belong, if we fall below that number and lose that status, it will cost us a couple million dollars a year. Luckily, the hold harmless allows us to be funded for that. So it's really important that we grow so that when we exit Hold Harmless, we're at that level. Otherwise, we would suffer that reduction in our funding in addition to whatever is the outcome of the student-centered funding formula. Um, if you'd like to know more about the target, I can hand it over to Dr. Scott, but I can tell you that the final target you see will be greater than that 19.2. We want it to be very realistic. We want to be conservative. Um, at the same time, we recognize that we are doing better than we thought we would be doing with our enrollment, and we do expect to have a much greater target when we come back to you. Because that's because of what we did in the summer and... Uh and, and winter in, intercessions? Yes, um, we were up quite significantly in the intercessions. We were up about 14% this summer, and we were up about over 10% last summer. So summers have become 
quite large for us. I think it's because we're running the two five week and then the six week and the eight weeks. So we have four sessions. We have something for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that has really paid off. And winter has similarly grown about 10%. Um, the primary terms are hurting us. And it's, and it's primarily the AB705 effect. It's math mostly. And also to some extent reading because reading is not required under AB705. When they wrote that original legislation, they didn't even know that some colleges had reading programs. Um, so those are the areas. But the biggest growth for us really, and especially in the intercessions, is online. About 40 to 45% of our offerings in winter and summer are online. I think we're pulling in the CSU students, the UC students, and that's been a big market for us. And, and online is gonna continue to grow. Right. And so, yeah. Do, do, do you, how much do, the, do you think the intercessions will add to our 19,024 total? You got your best guess. I know you know, you my concern about trying to um, look at this and give a number is I'm just really concerned about math. I don't know what's gonna happen with that. It's a big unknown. Um, if, if we can stabilize math to some extent, I'd say 19.5, 19, five, okay. 19 up 19.6 perhaps, it's the math factor that's, that's When you say me. stabilize math, what do you mean? Well, I don't, I don't, to get it to where it was before AB 705, um, it seems that some students may be putting math off, um, they may be hesitant to go into higher math classes, um, they're just, you know, there's a lot of change for students. And um, I don't know how that's impacting things, but math is down about 300 FTES. That's a lot just for one discipline. So I, you know, it's gonna, it, we have to continue to work with our students. I know counseling is doing a lot in that regard, um, but we just have to keep working and get students to take those classes. Yeah, do, do we have year over year, um, comparisons for completions, transfers, and certificates? We do. Um, mm -hmm. It is separate data, um, and forgive me, I'm recalling that we may have given a presentation on improvement in those areas um, at a previous board meeting um, not that long ago. Um, so I'll certainly make sure that we get that out there, but we do, and it is something that We've been focused on internally um, with great focus because that will be driving the student success portion of the grant. And so as we look forward, we look forward to that first year out of hold harmless and where do we land? And what can we reasonably expect to improve on between now and then? And I think hearing that we've had the record number of graduations this year is really positive um, it's just a matter of projecting that out for those next several years and looking at our trend line and seeing how does that look as we move forward. How far back do those year, do those year to year comparisons go? In other words, I'm trying to remember the presentation before, but is it two years? Is it? Three I'm years sorry, I can't recall how far yeah. back we went with the data. Can I just interject? Um, Trustee, did you get your questions ahead of time? I'm just, the only reason I ask is that you have quite a bit, and you know, just out of respect to everyone's time and staff, um, pre prepare, being prepared to respond to your questions. You know, this is something we've had as a practice and protocol. You know, we can spend a lot of time on um, going diving deep, but um, I mean, honestly, these are things we should have. We should have got in ahead of time, and so that so the staff can have proper responses for you and be ready and have adequate time to. They're, they're doing quite get well. You. Thanks for your well, for your observations. I've just got a few more questions. Um, so I'd like to give other board members a, 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 an opportunity too. So if you could please wrap it up, um, well, will, that would be that's great. That's what I said I will do. Thank you. Um, th so um, do oh, I, I saw that we're expecting some savings from reorganizations. What reorganizations are there? Thank you, so the reorganizations that we've done thus far, when I look at the areas I'm responsible for, we reorganized facilities. Um, so we will 
not be filling an assistant director position in facilities. So that's immediate savings. In IITS, we did not fill a director position, and instead we reorganized and elevated some positions and added some base positions. When um, we look at areas throughout the district, those types of reorganizations have happened throughout. For instance, in um, Human Resources in 1819, we did some one-time savings and we continue to look at how we can reorganize there. I know that student services will be going through additional reorganizations. And so it's really at every level. Um, we don't want to impact people any more than we need to. So sometimes those reorganizations take longer than we would want them to because we have to wait for that domino effect to be able to have true vacancies. But we are taking advantage of that ability as much as possible. And only in ways that support our operations without harming them. And you can see a lot of those organizations are accompanied by the dedication of the business, the BPR dollars for systems improvement. Thank you, okay. So, I, I mean, I'd like to see uh, hiring numbers for say the last five years for executive staff, management staff, faculty, and classifieds, just so I get a sense of what the trend lines are in that. I, I, I don't think that there's, uh, j just kind of how we're doing because I know that we've identified that as, as in our goals. And, and what are, do you know offhand, our metrics for successes and completion? Or do we say, okay, this is how much we hope to get this year or do we just kind of say we want to be successful? It's been a combination of both. When we look at our success metrics, we certainly have goals. We certainly know where we want to go year over year. And we have those goals that are the um, baseline, the reasonable, these are the minimum. And then we have those goals that are more uh, uh, looking to the best we can do. And it's not only a success, we're also looking at maybe improving the way we identify our Pell Grant eligible students um, so that we can get additional funding on the supplemental grant. So it is across the board, but we recognize that it's a, a, an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, again, as the state's changing the funding formula, some of those improvements will result in less increases in revenue in the future than we thought they would. Yes, and we do have success metrics. Um, we brought a scorecard, I want to say in December, perhaps, maybe it was January, um, and our plan is to up that, update that every year at the end of the year so you can start, but we also do have the year over year that we can provide as well. Just had one more. On in your slide thirty four, um, salaries and benefits as a percent of total expenditures and other outg and other outgo um, from last year to I mean from this year to next year, we're gonna go up about almost 1%. Um, I know we're working really hard to, to keep the, that, that number low for obvious reasons, but uh, do, you, do you have a sense of it? Is there a trend with that? Are we gonna be able to stop it at 89.3 or? Um, yes, thank you. The primary reason for that increase is bringing um, on full-time faculty to meet the FON in 1920. Um, also, it's compounded by the increases in stirs and purrs and a natural function of um, step and column. So when we look to 2021, it'll be more steady. We will have um, increases in fawn, and that'll be a good thing because that means we had increases in enrollment. Um, but they're not gonna be at the same degree. Uh, and I think that as we continue our reorganization efforts, it's going to stabilize our salaries. So I believe that yes, we will continue to see improvement in that number. And um, if you recall, when we started off the 1819 year, that number for 1819 was in, in excess of 90%. Um, and so we were able to get it below 
89, which I think is significant, and I would anticipate seeing similar improvement. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions for now. Other board members? Vice President Malauulu. I have a couple of dozen questions for you. Just kidding. I'm, I'm going to limit it to just one. Um, when you talked about the AB705 um, impact, is and I'm thinking outside the box here. If the answer is no, the answer is no. But is there anything that we can do to maybe reach out to Long Beach Unified, to maybe coordinate some kind of something, summer bridge program or some kind of mediation program to at least, and I know not, not every student in our district is a LVUSD student, but at <coughs> least we can catch the students from LVUSD high schools to try to prepare them prior to them getting on board. Is there anything that we can do, you know, in the future, maybe start, start working towards something like that? Sure, and I think this may fall under student services, and I'll let Mike answer, but yeah, we're doing a lot more with the high schools. So actually today we had over 200 um, direct high school matriculants um, come for our Viking summer voyage orientation, which is going to be starting in about three weeks. And one of the main focal points of our Viking summer um, voyage will be a focus on math skills and building the math skills of our students. And so I think um, that should provide that additional support um, and getting them college ready, right, to be successful in these um, transfer level math courses that many of them will be stepping into. So we've had a very laser focus on a lot of our redesigning our high school outreach model. Um, so like I said yesterday, we had about 75 students show up to orientation today, over 200. Um, we're looking like we're on track to have eight to 900 students participate in our inaugural Viking Summer Voyage, and so we're really excited about that. That is fantastic. And part two of my question, um, is there any way that we can reach out either to the high school counselors or the high school teachers, you know, with Long Beach Unified? Again, not every one of our students is from this local district. They could be from other districts. But is there any way we could um, either go to their campus and provide a little staff development or invite them to our campus? And I'll tell you why I'm suggesting something like that. Um, when I taught, um, there were college counselors from different colleges who visited our campus and led an in-service for a few hours on some of the basic writing skills that they expected our English students to have mastered. And originally they attended our senior teachers and then we requested that they go to our ninth grade teachers. And we had several in services where some of these high school admissions counselors, perhaps, I don't really know what their titles were, but they came and they took our ninth grade English teachers and gave them a checklist. Like, your student needs to be able to do this, this, and that. And that was so helpful, especially because we have such a high turnaround rate with high school teachers anyway that it was so helpful to have that in service. And I don't know where the budget came from. I don't know how they funded something like that. But can we you know, maybe explore the possibility of providing that service to high school teachers in math or English or whatever subject is causing our LBCC students to maybe fall behind? So yes, we can start to explore that. And I think that would actually be um, very appropriate with looking at using some of, leveraging some of our student equity achievement program dollars. Um, one of the indicators, you'll be approving an equity plan, hopefully be approving an equity plan tonight that talks about the different metrics and access is one of them. And recognizing that this potentially creates barriers for students, right, when they're not college ready and they don't have the skills to be successful. And so I think that is something that we can explore and I can work with Dr. Scott's office in looking at how we create professional, de professional development opportunities um, with our math faculty working with LBUSD's math faculty. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the CSU right now is um, going through a process where they are um, potentially <coughs> looking at requiring four years of math and what that would look like for um, um, quantitative reasoning at the senior level. So right now it's three years. And so it, the timing might be right because we might be able to even partner with Cal State Long Beach and kind of do something through the Long Beach Promise that brings in our Cal State partners as well because I think the high schools are going to have to think about what um, 
a fourth year quantitative reasoning will look like. And so I think Dr. Scott and I can probably put our heads together and then also bring it up at the next College Promise um, advisory, not advisory, excuse me, um, our council that we have that we meet to kind of review <coughs> our priorities. Anyone else? Any other questions? Trustee Antuk. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, in great question, um, Vice President Malulu. I was thinking the same thing. I, I'm a former uh, counselor, academic advisor, and I, I know the system has changed. And I was just talking to one of my neighbor's sons yesterday about he's coming to Long Beach City College and trying to get him prepared to get through math and English as soon as possible so he can start taking transferable classes as soon as possible to graduate as soon as possible and and my my oldest daughter I had her do that at Dominguez Hills where she took summer fall spring she was done with all of her math and English for a college career so she could pick what her classes afterwards and I and I keep telling students start in summer don't wait the fall to become a Viking start in summer so that you can get counseling one done know where the campus is at and try to knock out either one math or English or deficiency classes to, so you, you don't get restricted because right now, if you had to take, you know, English 105, that's in fall, and then you can take English 1 in spring, and then that's a prerequisite for psychology or some other class you take a year later. If you can knock it out in summertime, you can take it out year one versus year two, and you're more likely to get done faster. So it's, it's a very timely comment but and then I thought about yeah the counselors the teachers but the parents right we're always the ones actually making sure the kids sign up and and you know I, I know we get criticized for being helicopter parents but uh, you know if we don't do it <laughs> they're gonna be on their phone all day and it'll never happen you know so um, thinking about how to include parents and Long Beach Unified has a number of parent groups there's a, a African-American parents group that meets monthly that has about 100 people come to the meeting that it ends up being uh, a multiplier effect that they know and they share and they have some handouts and then we can start getting into the people's minds that the system has changed. What you knew as a college student 20 years ago doesn't apply anymore. This is the new math and English tracks. So it's really important I think we do that. A um, couple questions. I, I, on the FTF, FTS um, slide, I, I know our goal is 1900 or around 20,000. I continue to be get conflicting numbers of how many students do we have because I have seen 25 27 and 35,000 students it's not captured there I know there's part-time or full-time and these are equivalents um, with that slide it would just be I think apropos to have another line on there saying here's the total number of students even though this is the value and, and then I think about it as we're trying to hit our number where are our students coming from? Are we getting more FTSs from part-time than full-time? I know it's 60-40, but, you know, or, or if we're thinking about conversion goals, do we need to convert 10%, 40% to hit our number? You know, it's, it's and, it, and I know it's not, you know, that's more academic and enrollment management, but it also connects directly to the budget now, especially as we get closer to the end of the hold harmless period, we're gonna have less wiggle room and less chances to adapt. And I, and so I just, you know, how many students do we actually have? I don't want to speak uh, for Dr. Scott, but in response to your earlier comment about how that we need to know all those specifics, indeed they do use that as part of their modeling. When um, her team is looking at the target, they are looking at what's been generating those pieces of the FTES. I will certainly add to that slide the total number of students we have had and we project because it will add context. Um, and I'm sorry, I do not know the answer of how many students we have, but. It, I saw 35,000. No, that's answer. not correct. Yeah, go ahead and answer that's that. That's not that, correct. And I'll answer the piece of You know, I would have to look at it exactly, but it's, I think it's around 26,000, 27,000, right in that range. And then, but we have more part-time students than we do full-time students. So the FTES is going to be much lower, obviously. And in, in, in terms of growth, you know, with declining high school enrollment, we have challenges there. So we have to look at other markets. That's one of the reasons why you keep seeing all this non-credit on, on, on each agenda. We have the whole security guard non-credit on there tonight, all the fashion non-credit on there tonight. 
um, online is going to be a growth area for us, assuming we don't have to compete too much with the online college. Um, and dual enrollment is a growth area. So those are the things we really have to look at because they're places where we do have capacity to grow. Um, and with regard to you answering your question on the conversions, we do do um, mathematical computations on the, on the conversion rates. And one of the things, one of the reasons that we designed a welcome center was we realized that if we had been converting applicants at the national average like everyone else, that we would have never been in a deficit to begin with with regard to finance or FTE. So that's one of the reasons that we did the Welcome Center. And we do keep track. That number is going up. It is getting better. It is inching up thanks to the great work of the Welcome Center. And then a slide 37. I know there was some confusion in the past of the stirs and purrs. And, and I know it's changed as the negotiations go back and forth. And there were some additional stirs and purrs money put in, may revise in negotiations. Um, but again, the bottom line there, a total is the cumulative. How has that changed from last year? Because I, I feel like it was the cumulative was bigger. Um, Thank you. The cumulative was bigger, and that's because in the proposed budget, Governor Newsom dedicated three billion dollars to the STRS fund. The primary portion of that $3 billion was to reduce or to meet the state's obligation to fund STRS, but a portion of it was used to offset the increase for districts. This is K-14 districts' obligation to continue to pay an increased amount to STRS, and it reduced it by a couple of percentage points, so it was significant. So you can see on that chart that we still project an increase over 1819 but that number would have been closer to 19% than 17%. So yes, the total amount that we um, estimate that we will be paying to STRS more than they started the increases in 1314 is lower than when we last showed it, but that is because the governor has dedicated a tremendous amount of money to the STRS fund. And when I guess when we're thinking about this uh, ourselves, you know, people talk about long-term liability, addressment, it's getting smaller, but is it only through state action or, you know, on the other side of the formula with PERS, how much has the PEPRA reform helped us or saved us or reduced our growth rate on that side of the column? Do we, do we have a tracking of what's been, like, has that even been an effective state policy for us that is reducing our liability with now people having a lower formula for new employees? Well, what's interesting is that there's a significant difference between how the employer contribution rates are determined for STRS and PERS. STRS is done through legislation. It is statutorily set. So there's a law that says this is the rate. PERS, the PERS board sets it themselves annually. And so they evaluate a combination of the savings they would have gotten through those changes in the PERS structure along with the performance of their fund. And in this case, this most recent change they made um, just a couple of days ago was as a result of the Budget Act containing an extra provision towards PERS that wasn't there in the May revision, so they get to consider that as well. So the PERS reacts annually to both changes in the fund that they've made with the two different types of contributions as well as the performance of the fund itself. And I guess I hope in when we come to the final budget, I'd like to see what have we, how has it changed over the last three years? Sure. You know, how we, what, a, what have we done versus what externally has been done? You know, did the early retirement program help us reduce our liability by X amount or some percentage? Just because I constantly, I feel like I get questions a lot of, what are you guys doing about long-term liability? Um, and, and I know it's going down, but I can't say specifically why. Um, other thing on the on the BPRs, um, we're talking about the fund. Do we know how of the initiatives that we did this year? How much do they save? Did they generate? We spent a million dollars and generate five million dollars in savings or two hundred thousand dollars in savings. What what happened? Because I know that was a big thing this past year part of the deficit reduction. It was, and the use of the BPR money was not exclusive to those cost-saving measures. 
some of the dedication of those BPR funds was necessary to address needed improvements in things like financial aid or to have changes in our systems to respond to what we're doing with guided pathways or with helping students complete. So some of the dedication of those resources was not done as a cost-saving measure, but rather as an improvement to a system that was necessary. <coughs> other dedication of those resources was done as a cost-saving measure. Um, so what I'd like to do, if it's agreeable, is at a future meeting bring back an examination of what the BPR has been used for, what we've accomplished thus far, and separate it into those two pots, because we really did have an improvement in some system or process that was unrelated to an expectation of savings, and then others that was done specifically to streamline and have savings. Because that was one of our key tactics of reducing the budget without having to lay people off, correct? Correct. And so correct. I just want to make sure that we can quantify that worked. Those are wonderful questions, Trustee Enzo. Um, I have that on the list of board requests that has been approved, and we have it slated, I believe, in a fall 2019 for a presentation. Yeah. And then um, where in the budget is the chief sustainability officer? Do we have a classification? Anybody doing that? Thank you. We do not. The Chief Sustainability Officer duties are performed by our Senior Director of Facilities. So with the Integrated Energy Master Plan, as part of every single project we have that we're undergoing on campus, as well as supplemental projects to continue to implement that plan, it is embedded in all of our facilities. And as such, it is our Senior Director of Facilities who is our Chief Sustainability Officer and who would focus on those energy and sustainability measures. Okay. Um, and then... On the, where in the budget is the funding coming for for the homeless housing RFP and the North Long Beach RFP? Is that in general fund or specific restricted fund because it's evaluated where? So as we closer, look- Where would you, we find that? As we look at the development of those RFPs, and I think we shared before that part of the problem with the initial RFP was that it was very broad and we needed to narrow it down. And that with the progress we've made with the establishment of the Office of Basic Needs, as well as the progress we've made to have a hub in North Long Beach, we can better identify how to gather that data. The funding source is dependent upon that RFP itself. If the RFP deals with solely the building and construction project, then that would be paid from bond funds because that's a bond project. If it deals with the identification of those students or a broader area, then we look at how we're funding that effort period. That if we're using a specific grant or restricted fund to support serving students with housing and food insecurities, that same source could be used for the RFP. Um, failing that, then it is a general fund designation. So as we create that RFP, those are part of the considerations is how we construct it determines where the budget comes from. So the homeless housing can be funded through bond funding, the RFP evaluation, North Long Beach would be general fund. Correct. Okay. Correct. As long as the homeless housing is specifically looking at the feasibility of that building and isn't getting too broad, we have to be very careful with the bond funds, obviously. And I wanted to one, I guess one last question on kind of something Kathy was saying related to the summer of being kind of our lifesaver, uh, that we offer these alternative schedules and four, five, six, eight weeks. Um, and one of the, you know, looking at the presentations we had that, you know, we don't, 44% of people in Long Beach need AA degree to participate in the economy in the next five years. Is, is there a way, or I mean, has it already been tried, or we're already doing it? It's almost like, can we do an accelerated AA degree that would be uh, a shorter, quicker time period that will maybe alternate in fall and, and spring? That's a way to boost enrollment and get people, I don't know if we, tr we, we target mid-career or people who had some college already to complete, um, but wouldn't that generate, potentially replicate our summer revenue into fall and spring? You know, we've looked at that, and um, we, we can do it. Students are gonna be able to do it online. That's, that's really gonna be the way to go if we have eight-week online classes, which we already do. So 
it's it's tough for people who are working though because they can't necessarily go full time. So accelerated may be going part time for two years and being able to come out with a completion, but doing a lot of it online. So we do see that, and online is changing everything. Um, if it's coming onto campus, the number of hours are really significant, and other schools who have tried to do that have not done particularly well, because students have to be here so many hours on top of working a full-time job, and they just, they, quite often, they don't, they don't finish. I guess I think of like the weekend MBA programs, or you know, you know the, we've we've talked to three other colleges. And come on a Saturday for. They drop out. We've yeah. talked to three other college presidents, and they don't do well. And people put a lot of time and effort into those types of programs. And quite often, they're just not, that they end up with, you know, they get 50% drop rate, and they end up with just a very small number of students. And, you know, with online, I think that's more the way to go. And, and, I, and I agree with you. We could add in, you know, eight weeks and, and do more of that. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Moving on, item 10.2, five-year construction plan for 2021 to 2025. This is in action that the Board of Trustees approved the annual submission of the district's five-year construction plan for FY 2021 to 2025 and authorize the superintendent president of the district to sign the formal documents that authorize action on behalf of the district as, as submitted. We've received the information. Is there a motion and a second? Moved by Vice President Malu, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? I got a question. Um, can Trustee Entuk? Yeah, thanks. Um, can staff just give a little brief summary? I, I looked through the fusion and there's um, 77 pages here. Is there anything new or different that substantially changed uh, on this plan and what we're adding in versus wasn't there before? Thank you. Yes, um, and just as a reminder, this plan goes to the state. It's used primarily by the state to anticipate our need for state funding for state bonds. Um, nothing in this plan is um, set in stone that you are able to independently make other decisions, but this does help the state know what we anticipate bringing towards you, and it does relate to the IPPs that you will see later in the agenda for your approval. The summary is on page four. So if you turn to page four, you will see the listing of 12 projects. Page of those, four of the 77 page one? Yes, page four. Oh, oh, okay. Page four in the document. Yeah, and um, so the documents that follow that page are the detailed documents because it lays out a lot of detailed information, but page four pretty much gives you the story. It shows you the buildings and the projects that we've already started, and then if you look at um, line item number nine, through 12, you'll see that there are some ones that we haven't done yet. And so, for instance, I mentioned earlier that we are very happy that GNH got back in the funding queue. You'll see that that's number nine. And that indicates that that's $17 million we hope to receive from the state for that project. And that's the plan for moving forward if indeed that stays in the signed budget act and then we can move forward. If it were not, so there was a moment in time where there was a risk that we wouldn't get that. This plan would have been the same plan you would have been approving today. We just would have had a subsequent um, action with you guys and letting you know that we were changing the schedule around because if we're not getting state funding for that project, then we can look at other priorities. I guess a question, um, so say we, two years from now, say, oh, okay, we've done our analysis. We want to do student housing. Can we add it to year three or does it have to go to year five and we got to wait five years until we hit that point. There's not a requirement that it only be additive at the end. You can revise the entire five-year plan. But having said that, there are restrictions on our receipt of the state bond funds. We have to use them for the project that was approved and we have to spend them within a specific amount of time. And because we do have a tight construction schedule on each campus and we don't want to interrupt classes, it is hard to disrupt this plan 
going out within the next three years because the construction's been planned for the next three years. For instance, the Kinesiology Lab and Aquatic Center the ground breaks in November and then continues for two years. So it's hard to interrupt it, understanding the very tight time frame, but there is flexibility within that. Thank you. All right, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Moving on to item 10.3, initial project proposal. Uh, this is an action that the board approved the initial project proposal for building B renovation project at the liberal arts campus and PCC classroom building project at the PCC um, campus as submitted. Um, is there a motion? I move. Moved by Trustee Otto. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice President Malolu. Are there any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes item 10.4, resolution cash flow borrowing from Los Angeles County Treasurer. This is a uh, an action item that the board adopt resolution number 062619B to authorize short-term borrowing of up to 118.1 million from the LA County Treasurer as submitted. We've received the information and it is properly noticed. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Inta, second by Trustee Baxter. Are there any questions, comments? Question. Question from Trustee Inta. This is, uh, this is the first time I recall seeing this, but it, how often do we end up having to do uh, cash flow borrowing from the county? Is it quarterly, so monthly, once a year? This resolution we do annually, and it's a just-in-case resolution. We haven't had to do any borrowing from the county treasurer. Back in 2007-8, when we had the big state budget crisis, one of the actions the state took to manage their own general fund was to delay payments to K-12 and community college for a month. And that delay was unexpected and it was all of the sudden. Most districts managed it through the issuance of trans or trans, um, tax revenue anticipation notes. However, if you ran out of cash flow and a trans takes at least nine months to plan for, you're very limited. You can borrow from your other funds, which is the next resolution you'll be considering, or you can borrow from the treasurer. Borrowing from the treasurer is the last chance borrowing. Normally you do it if something arises at the last minute and you've got no other option and it's repaid immediately from the very next revenues you receive. I do not anticipate ever having to do this. However, based on the state experience, where if something goes wrong and there's a mid-year cut and all of a sudden we're not getting the revenues, we need to have this so that we can preserve our ability to pay payroll and keep the lights on. How much does the treasurer charge us? The treasurer can only charge you the interest they earn, which is minimal, because they have a very conservative investment strategy. They cannot make money off of us. One to two percent at best. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes item 10.5, resolution, um, to get it up, uh, a resolution for cash flow temporary interfund cash borrowing. This is an action um, recommended that the board adopt resolution number uh, 62619C to authorize short term borrowing between funds of up to 20.6 million as submitted. Is there a motion and a second? Move, so moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Intuk, seconded by Vice President Malaulu. Are there any questions? Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes um, unanimously. Item 10.6, resolution agreement with California Department of Education State Preschool Program. Is an action on the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 062619D authorizing the district to enter into grant agreement CN 93188.6 with California Department of Education as submitted. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Anta. Is there any are there any questions? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes item 10.7, resolution agreement with California Department of Education General Child Care. This is an action that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 62619E, authorizing the district to enter into grant agreements CN 93188.7 with California Department of Education as submitted. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. 
Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Vice President Malauulu. Are there any questions, comments on this item? All in favor? All right, we will now move on to item 10.8, resolution to uh, liability and workers' compensation coverage for volunteers. Um, this is also an action item that the board adopt resolution number 62619F, uh, declaring the purposes of workers' compensation and liability insurance that persons authorized to perform volunteer services shall be deemed as employee of the district as submitted. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. moved by Trustee Intuk. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? Is, is, uh, this, the, Inter is this the first time we're doing this, or is this a, an ongoing thing we do every year of making sure we're covering our volunteers? This is an annual um, action, and this just ensures that we're providing our volunteers with the same access to um, coverage as we would for employees when they're volunteering on our behalf. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Vice President Malauulu. Does this cover uh, when we subcontract to Staff Pro, or do they have their own carrier? Great question. For all of our contractors, anybody we pay to perform a service, they insure themselves as well as have their own certificate of insurance that protects us from any liability. So our relationship with vendors is far different than our relationship with employees or volunteers. Are there any other questions, comments? Um, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes uh, unanimously. Item 11.1, 2019-2022, student equity plan. This is an action item of the Board of Trustees approved the Long Beach Community College District student equity plan as submitted. Long Beach City College, uh, uh, well, you all have received the um, information. Uh, I'm not gonna keep you long by reading the item. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by um, Trustee Intuk, are there any questions, comments? I do. Trustee Intuk. Um, I was hoping um, this. Is, uh, sorry, we're student equity plan. Um, I read through it and I and I saw a couple of things are duplicated throughout for different groups. I don't know if you can speak to the strategy and behind it and, and kind of what's different now. I think this is probably your first one, Mike. Or, I, I think this is your sure. So your document. So the chancellor's office requires all community colleges to submit a student equity plan. This particular plan will cover us from 2019 through 2022. Um, they did change the methodology in terms of how we determine who is disproportionately impacted, as well as the data set that was used to determine that disproportionality. Um, and so our dean, um, Head of Ed Muckleberg, would be able to probably speak more specifically to the methodology if there's questions about the specific methodology. Um, we followed our planning process and went through our student equity committee. And so we have um, our student equity faculty coordinator here with us tonight, Dr. Matt Lawrence, that if there are questions about the process he could speak to as well. Um, but essentially this moved through our equity committee and was reviewed as our student success committee as well um, for <laughs> acceptance and approval. And so, what you have before you tonight is the plan that was executed by um, the team. And I guess a qu another qu couple questions on like, it has like transfer and success goal, like baseline seven, goal 10. Are these bodies or this a metric that the state has that we're trying to- What page move? are you referring uh, I'm to? I'm sorry, something? I'm looking on page 11 of the PDF and the document. Okay. So it, this is in the current and former I, foster youth female. I see what you're saying. Um, it says transfer baseline seven, goal 10. Mm -hmm. So so essentially when you're looking at the different activities that are proposed for the disproportionately impacted students, the baseline refers to the number of students that are in that particular um, disproportionate impact group. And then if we want to be able to make improvements, we, we would have to increase. So it's actual like number of students, not necessarily percentages. And that's the way the chancellor's office has um, essentially laid out this um, format. So again, it's not a percentage increase per se, but it's actually, these are the number of students that you would have to increase in order to reach, to achieve um, the elimination of that disproportionate impact. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I'm Matt Lawrence, Student Equity Coordinator. Uh, we put the, you've got the executive summary of the plan, 
The actual plan is in a, the NOVA template provided by the Chancellor's Office, and the Chancellor's Office actually preloads those baseline numbers, and they set a couple of equity goals. One they called minimum equity, uh, the other was full equity. <laughs> Their definition of minimum equity was within 2% of full equity, and it's driving researchers crazy, but somehow the math works. But um, Heather Van Volkenberg has crunched the numbers on it, and it, it turns out their minimum equity goal is very closely aligned to a, what we see as a closing of the equity gaps by about 40%, which aligns with the vision of success goals. And that's what we were originally shooting for before we saw this, and so we thought, okay, they seem to be driving toward this minimum equity goal, which is about that same 40% goal. And we talked with the constituent groups, and they, they felt like those were the goals that we could shoot for. Okay. Yeah, I remember, I mean, I looked at the documents online from previous years, very different look, mm -hmm. and very generic, plain. Uh, I felt like a minimalist effort. Uh, but I know that sometimes you have state required formats you got to fill out. But this is much more robust, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, one, one thing I was looking at, I, I see like the, you know, the president's equity task force listed a number of times. I know we're doing a, a racial justice climate survey. I didn't see that listed. I feel like that's a um, student equity outcome driven. Right. Effort, now, but, uh, yeah. My, my understanding that that was actually to be a, a component of uh, the president's equity task force. So we've got the equity president's equity task force listed throughout the plan. And I believe that climate study was going to be part of that. And uh, I, which is good, good to know. And, I, and there's a number of things just bullet point listed. And I was wondering, like, where do you find the details of that? I guess is uh, the details of uh, we have faculty equity leader cohort training listed. Yeah, yeah. So we've got. <laughs> We've got a lot of things on the plan. We don't have these listed here. The details are in a number of places. I mean, Mike is running a lot of these programs and he's got the details of those. The, say the faculty equity leaders cohort is something that uh, we're working on. We're gonna, we were hoping to perhaps start that this fall, but we decided we needed a little more vetting with the Senate and other, other faculty uh, constituent groups, but we're we're still working on the design of that, so it's sort of a work in progress. So some of these activities are long established activities; others are new, like the Viking Summer Bridge and so forth. Um, so some of these are are even being developed as we speak. Do do we do a campus version that's different than this, or we only report based on the chancellor's office? requirements so yeah. at, so at this time because and I think I, I should have probably mentioned this prior to this equity plan we actually went through an integrated planning process um, an integrated plan was submitted I think probably about three years ago and so essentially this is the new template and design that the Chancellor's Office has released and it, Brevity has been kind of what we've been encouraged to not go into, as you can imagine, the chancellor's office has to review 114 colleges. So this is the template that they've given us. So we're not required essentially to provide um, any more additional reporting on the activities other than what you see in the plan. We do have to do some fiscal reporting with our student achievement and equ our student equity achievement program budgets, but again, not any kind of granular detail separated, separated and now that they've been separated into the consolidated block grant so um, essentially what we would be doing is internally having our own working with institutional effectiveness to evaluate many of these activities so that we make sure that the activities that we are saying are going to have impact on equity are actually having impact and I think that's where when um, we meet as a um, equity committee with the institutional effectiveness, we'll be able to provide you with maybe some of those more richer executive summaries about some of the different mm -hmm. program activities that we are gonna be assessing and measuring to make sure that the impact is, is what we think it should be. Great, thank you so much. <coughs> thank you, are there any other questions, comments on item 11.1? All in favor? 
Motion passes uh, unanimously. Item 12.1, Academic Senate President, Jorge Ochoa. Oh, thank, thank you, you for your you. patience. <clears throat> so I just thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, everybody for having a great graduation. Congratulate the students uh, that were with us in the beginning of the m uh, month. Uh, we had a wonderful ceremony. Uh, I want to congratulate all the faculty who are now teaching summer courses and uh, wish best uh, luck to the students. And uh, thank Senate Exec for uh, the wonderful support. And I want to congratulate Gary Florence, who's sitting on uh, the audience, uh, who will be sitting here next month. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Scott. Uh, I, she did not explain the gift that she gave me, uh, but that is uh, my first uh, publication on a new species of passing flower. Uh, to the science world, so that's from the Dominican Republic, so now I get to frame it uh, and put it in my office. So thank you, Dr. Scott, and uh, thank uh, the board for allowing me the opportunity. I think this is a great experience, and I would recommend every faculty to become a leader and uh, be sitting here at some point in their academic life here at Long City College. Thank, thank you, you, Jorge. Um, classified Senate President, Danny Engel. Uh, yes, we, uh, um, I actually have something to report this time. Uh, we went to Classified Leadership Institute up in Tahoe, and we had some great professional development courses there. Uh, I, um, myself, Cece, and Jimmy Flowers also presented a course called the Communication Script Strategies for uh, an Engaged Classified Senate. It was very well received, and a lot of people were there. Uh, we got our team spirit on, and we won the Spirit Twig Award. <laughs> so um, there's a little video of that. Maybe you'll see that someday. <laughs> and, of course, what the highlight was probably having our own uh, President Reagan um, Ramali up there to uh, receive the uh, Servant Leadership Recognition Award, and well-deserved, and we are very proud of uh, having her at that event with us. And as this is my last uh, time on the dais, I just want to thank everybody for all of your support uh, and, and uh, guidance through the couple years here that I've been part of this uh, Classified Senate. And uh, I will be seeing you around. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. We will now move on to Board of Trustees report. Trustee Otto. Given the hour, I'll have no report. Trustee Baxter? I'll be quick. I'll talk fast. Okay, since the last meeting, I've attended a number of uh, student award banquets, went to the Port of Long Beach event uh, celebrating the Maritime Academy and scholarships, attended the Phi Kappa Theta uh, induction ceremony, the Cottonwood Awards, the transfer reception, Women Build LA um, program, uh, the nursing completion ceremony, obviously commencement, which was fantastic, the Philippine independence celebration in Carson, uh, Leadership Long Beach 30th anniversary, and then finally uh, the Gillis Brown Memorial. Gillis was a um, PE teacher here and uh, a very good soul, and it was I represent the college at her uh, memorial. That's it. Vice President Malau. Yes, I would like to um, begin my report by asking, if I may, whose idea it was to do these banners. And I know that the communications team is extremely humble, so they're probably going to do this, right? And just say it was everybody's idea. So whoever had the brilliant idea to do these banners, Thank you so much. They are absolutely fantastic. I got a text of the journalism banner a couple of days ago, and I was like so excited to see that. But I had no idea the extent of how many banners there were. I thought you just did a journalism banner. <laughs> I didn't realize that you had so many others. Um, I'm going to challenge whoever had the great idea. Joshua Castellanos and company. I, so I'm, I'm looking at Joshua because I figured it was you and your wonderful team because the entire communications team is fantastic. You guys put in so much extra time and effort and it shows. Um, but I'm going to challenge you if there's any way we can scrape up the money 
to put these banners around the city, around the district, the neighboring cities, Lakewood and Signal Hill, um, maybe two or three on one major street. And I'm going to tell you why. So Long Beach Unified has that campaign every year for a couple of months after graduation. And I live on the west side, and they actually put pictures of students from Cabrillo High School and Poly High School, their graduation picture, and their college that they're attending. And that has been such a successful campaign where you've got so many community kids who are looking up to somebody they know, the college that they're going to. So I'm wondering if maybe we can strike up a deal somewhere and start putting these banners throughout the city and the district. So I don't know after that budget report, you know, maybe we could scrape up the funds to do that and we can ask the powers that be if we could do that. So this is fantastic. I might have to check with the vice mayor of Lakewood on that item. There you go. We, we know people, right? We know people. All right. So I also attended probably um, every event that trustee Baxter attended. We usually roll together. Um, so I was at the classified um, year-end luncheon, which was outstanding. I attended the same day the mail summit, which was across the street, which was also outstanding. Um, I was at the Cottonwood Awards. I bought a pony. Thank you, Trustee Otto. It was a pleasure being there. And my kids think I really did buy an actual pony, but it was a fundraiser stuffed animal. But now I have to make good and take them to the ranch so they can see a real pony. Um, this, I kind of messed up on this one. On May 29th, there was an event in my district at Silverado Park where council member Roberto Uranga, who uh, was a former trustee here, um, hosted an event where he allocated $50,000 to put up murals in our district. And he actually heard presentations from 11 artists. And I, I'm sorry I left it at home, but several of those artists were LBCC alumni. So I really wanted to recognize them, my bad, but there are several of those artists whose proposals were shared at that event, and I was so proud that they're LBCC students vying for that great opportunity to have murals put up in the community. Um, on May 31st, that was a really busy day, um, I attended the Building Trades opening reception at um, the Laborers Local, and then we rushed over to the ASB banquet. And by the way, I do have photos. Dario, am I talking too fast? So, okay, so I should have started with that. Memorial Day, I'd like to commend the Veterans Club on campus for honoring um, so many veterans. I thought it was a, a really great campaign that they ran um, with the flags. And um, they every year they make it a point to honor the 22 a day. And um, that's always been a, an event near and dear to my heart. I always had my students cover that. Okay, let's go to the next one because I know we're going fast. So this is the event at Silverado Park. And these are some of our LBCC students, not the two little boys in the front, those are mine. But um, some of the artists there were LBCC students. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. This was the Building Trades reception. Um, you could see Mr. Ron Miller there. And um, the lady next to me is our very own Dr. Lynn Shaw. And then next to her, you've got two of my ILWU sisters and then Pat Williams, who's an electrician. That was, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. The same night, we rushed over to the ASB banquet, Arabian Nights, which was really cool. Took my kids to see Aladdin that weekend because of this event. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Keep, keep going, because I just wanted to showcase what the ASB did. Now, this was the next morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. Trustee Untuck owes me big time. He had committed to welcoming um, all of the Boy Scouts to our campus for a major centennial event, and he was unable to make it. So, um, And it was raining, by the way. So I took one for the team and got to welcome them. And it was particularly significant because this is the first year that the Boy Scouts has opened it up to girls. Jamboree. The, jamboree. the Jamboree. It was Scout, yeah, Scoutorama, Scoutorama, that was the name of the event. So um, it was the first time that they opened it up to girls. In the next slide, you'll see um, our very own Skinner. This is Mrs. Skinner. So she's very active in the Boy Scouts. All right, so, and there's Dr. Romali, and the lady in the middle, believe it, is one of my ILWU union sisters as well, and we don't dress like that when we're working on the docks. 
All right, um, and then that, there's no picture for the next event, but then from there, okay, well, not that one, but from there I went to the Kamai um, High School Scholarship Awards and was able to um, present awards to some of these students that graduated from uh, local area high schools will be attending LBCC. Um, the next event, and this slide is a little early, but the next event that I wanna talk about is graduation. It was fantastic. It had to have been the best graduation that I've been a part of, um, not only because of the large size of the class that we graduated, but also all the details and all the touches, um, the canopy, the chair, the stage. It, it was just such a well done, classy event. Really, Dr. Romali, you and the staff should be commended for um, going above and beyond, making it a beautiful event. And I think it made everybody feel special, not just the students and the families, but also the staff, the faculty, and everybody who had a part in putting it together. I know it was a lot of work, but you all did a great job. And then um, one neat thing that happened after graduation is um, there was a little bit of a celebration afterward, which was nice because there were a lot of staff members there, and it was an opportunity to socialize off campus, which rarely happens. Uh, so it was very nice. Okay, the event that you see on the screen was this past Monday. It was a fundraiser for the Conservation Corps. Before, don't go to the next slide just yet, Dario. I want to um, also say thank you to Kirsten, outgoing uh, LBCC FA president. Welcome to Diane for next year. Thank you to Susan. Um, for your hard work with the classified staff. And then um, also I'd like to thank Jorge, welcome to Jerry. Thank Annie, you guys all have done a fantastic job serving. I know that it takes a lot of time and a lot of hours. With your permission, uh, I know that you requested to adjourn the meeting in memory of our current staff member who passed away, but I'd also like to ask that we also adjourn the meeting in memory of Carolyn Smith Watts, who, um, was my constituent. She um, just lived a couple of blocks away from me. Dario, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this was taken at her wake. Um, I had an opportunity to speak at her wake. Um, you will remember Carolyn as the person who was very instrumental in having the um, Lighting the Way presentation of the 12 African American women who contributed more than 600 years of leadership to the city of Long Beach collectively. And that program did make a stop here on our campus. And these women are phenomenal. And Carolyn Smith Watts um, was very instrumental in helping me get here in this chair. And she passed away um, just last month. And I, I miss her terribly. And she was not only my constituent, but she was my neighbor and she was my friend. And she contributed a lot to um, some of the extracurricular activities of this college. So I would like to uh, also adjourn today's meeting in her memory. Thank you. Trustee Antuck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I did attend a number of events, uh, including the Leadership Long Beach uh, 30th anniversary. Um, I want to say thank you to Annie. Uh, it's been great working with you probably five or six years now, um, and I'm really excited and happy for your retirement. And I know, and I hope you're not going far, and we still have you around, and maybe we sign you up as a part-time professor, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but I just wanna say thank you for all your good work. I mean, from playing the songs at the holiday party, you know, with the elf hat on, it's, uh, you, you've been such a, a warm and special asset to the college and the community, and I'm just really thankful for you, all you've done, so thank you again. Um, Thank you to uh, Trustee Malulu. She um, saved me. I, I confirmed to the Boy Scouts like three months ago, and then I had a conflict I couldn't get out of. And um, it was a 100-year anniversary where they had all the Eagle Scouts in Long Beach um, come were here for for the Scout Rama. And I, I'm I think I'm the only elected official Eagle Scout in Long Beach. And so we were we were at the Boy Scout thing uh, celebration a month ago, and. I got recognized and they were like, oh, you need to come and welcome and, um, you know, it just didn't work out, but I'm really thankful for that. And, um, I'm actually going to a Eagle Scout banquet this Sunday. Um, and then yes, graduation was great. It was just great energy. Um, the crowd, uh, the families, the, um, the layout, you know, uh, it was, it all worked, you know, just the imagery, the music, 
I did was double checking which way I should go to the flag uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance because there was the pole flag and the signs or the screens had a fake flag and so that but it, it all it all worked out and I brought my uh, my 13 year old I was talking to her the day before and she goes oh I've never been to a college graduation and I said okay uh, yeah you weren't born when mom and I graduated so yeah um, come on down and so that was her first time seeing the tassels and the procession and she was asking what's the big stick that they were holding in the front and it's everybody has funny hats who's why is that hat you know so trying to explain what's a jd versus a phd and so it was a really you know she's a seventh grader it was a really good uh learning experience for her so uh just thank you for everybody who who worked hard and um you know help help make it a great event um and that's that's all i got thanks thank you trustee and tuck um i just wanted to i mean it Look, folks, we're re reaching six-hour mark, and I don't want to be aiding and abetting in that, um, but I just wanted to just, uh, beyond what was mentioned, echo um, my congratulations to staff, the American Association of Port Authorities. Uh, they present us with this award for our leadership in um, bringing workforce development and the port together and really working on a whole nother level and the partnership. The mo partnership is being used as a model uh, for all ports throughout the nation are being um, looked at as a model. Uh, hopefully they'll use it as a model and that was what this uh, symposium and summit was for. Um, with that, um, I just uh, wanted to uh, thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to serve as your board president. I believe this is my last board meeting. I tried my best. Um, it was my, uh, you know, first time uh, at the job. Uh, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, I'm sure you're all going to do a far better job than I, I have done. Um, and I, I thank you for giving me the honor of being your president. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully um, next month uh, we'll be more smooth than this month's. Um, going to item 12.4, board travel. We don't have any items to report. Trustee committees. Um, any items that I don't have any uh, on that as well? 13.1, public comments on non-agenda items. We did not receive any um, speaker cards. Item 14.1, we don't need a second closed session. And item 15.1, um, before we adjourn tonight's meeting to July 24th at Liberal Arts Campus Building T, room 1100, closed session would be at 4.30 and open session would be at 5.30. We'll, we'll adjourn tonight's meeting in honor of uh, Joan Zuckerman and also Carolyn Watts smith and uh, with a moment of silence. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned to July 24th.